Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Heavy on the mister. How are you, Jim? I'm good, man. I'm good. Still back down here in uh, Florida, enjoying Jacksonville Beach. You know, the uh, football schedule, uh, college football schedule, I'm sure you're the same boat. You, we're, we don't really know how this season is going to progress or if it will. Will it end as, it is, as it's currently booked? Or will it, uh, another outbreak or outbreaks occur that prevent uh, the game from continuing? So <clears throat> I'm spending more time in Florida right now during football season, more than I ever dreamed I would because of the uncertainty of the football situation. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not big on a stadium with 20,000 people when it seats 85. Right. Uh, and I understand though, how, why it is. Right. I'm also not big on going to a football game. And sitting around a whole lot of other people that may or may not be wearing masks, even though they're supposed to wear them. So <clears throat> it's a different, a whole different era. This, <clears throat> this damn virus stuff. It's just, I'm tired of it. And, uh, but you, we got to endure it because it's a, it's a killer. So, uh, I'm back in Florida enjoying that. A lot of AEW stuff, you know, uh, we, we've had some good TVs and a good pay-per-view and I, I'm tickled that we're here, but, uh, if you're going to be hanging someplace, Hanging out on the beach at my stage of life ain't a bad thing. Not, not a bad way to wake up and look out your window and see the ocean and see the sand. And if there's, there's a peace of mind there that sounds kind of melancholy or maybe childish even to some people, but it's just a, it's a different way of life, Conrad. It's a different way of life. And I, so far I'm really enjoying it. Well, we're glad you're enjoying it. You've earned it, my friend. And. You guys have been cooking with gas on AEW lately. We appreciate all your efforts there. Of course, all out was a big success. And, uh, you know, we've got fans back in there for dynamite and, you know, dynamite quit bouncing around a little bit and was back on Wednesdays. It's a good time to be an AEW fan. And, uh, it's a great time to be a wrestling fan right now because you get a topic like we're covering today, which, you know, for whatever reason, this is going to be one of our more controversial subjects. Because we're talking about a guy who hasn't always given glowing reviews on AEW. We're talking about your old pal, Jim Cornette, James E. Cornette, who believe it or not, was born on September 17th. So a week from today will be his birthday, born in back in 61 in Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, he got his start in professional wrestling as luck would have it in a similar fashion to Paul Heyman, taking wrestling pictures at ringside. Eventually he'd work in the ring announcing and timekeeping and He's even working with magazines at the age of 14, man, that just seems really unlikely that something like that could happen today. But back then, I guess this was a great way for any kid to get started taking pictures at ringside, right? Yeah, it was. And, you know, we've talked about this before that some of the greatest stars in a variety of uh, skill sets, announcing, managing wrestling, the, the one common denominator we find with these people is the fact that they, they were wrestling fans as kids for whatever they, uh, the allure was, uh, it, it, it engulfed them. 
Cornette was no different. Cornette was very lucky that uh, he got the opportunities he did there with Jerry Jarrett and uh, and Lawler and all those folks there in Memphis because uh, it was such a tight tight group, a tight uh, fraternity, almost a nonviolent mafia was the uh, in some of the traits, not murder, not that type of thing, but it's the the inside information, keeping it close to the vest, things of that nature. So uh, he was lucky. And I think that I used to kid him about this all the time. The reason you got your break there, because you work cheap, as in for nothing. But he got to go to the wrestling matches. And he got the best seat in the house because he was at ringside with his camera. It's funny sometimes to go back and see some of the old footage, uh, some of the great times and matches in Memphis, and see Corn uh, young Jim Cornette with his camera at ringside. And like you said, Conrad, right on the money. Uh, even though I used to t tease he and Heyman, uh, when we were all together in a meeting or a room or something, uh, you guys are a lot alike. It's just that Heyman wears less polyester than Cornette wears, but you guys are two peas in a pod. And they would just, they just couldn't understand how I could even say that. <laughs> so, uh, but they were, and there's a lot of similarities there. So Corny is a, a very polarizing figure in today's marketplace. But as you and I talked about Conrad, before we started recording Cornette's legacy cannot be strictly judged by the perception that he has created for himself as this uh, polarizing lightning rod, almost a Howard Stern like individual saying crazy things, outrageous things. And maybe they're not crazy. Maybe they're just things that maybe we all think to some degree, but just aren't, don't have the balls to say. So, uh, I, this is going to be a fun show because he's a very engaging character. And again, the thing that I would just encourage folks to, to, to think about is, and it's not like I'm defending him off the, out of the bat. I, I'm really not. But the, the reality of it is that we can't judge Jim Cornette, uh, on 2000. Uh, that's not what we're going to talk about 2000 and his mindset nowadays and things of that nature, if we want to, but his journey to, to get to 2000 is nothing short of incredible. Let's get to it. We've, uh, we've got to acknowledge that he's going to debut as a manager back in 82 as the manager for Sherry Martell. And I guess his gimmick, I mean, how would you describe his gimmick? I mean, a rich kid turned an up manager. I mean, yeah. he's, he's clearly looking for, for quote unquote heel heat and to be hateable. And well, in some of the towns that you know, these quote unquote spot shows would happen. The socioeconomics of the area, you know, a little spoiled brat, rich kid. That's heat, right? Yeah. It played well. It played well to the, to the typical, uh, wrestling fan of that era and specifically, uh, in the South, because people in the South, uh, there's a lot more, and of course, anywhere it's this, it's this way, but you're in a minority if you're a rich guy, uh, cause there's a lot fewer folks that are rich that aren't, uh, that are, I should say. So yeah, it played well. It was, and it's easy to explain, easy to understand. We all could get it. And then he just, just perpetuated that whole image, uh, to perfection, you know, uh, having the money and all this stuff and mama's boy. And, and, you know, it was obvious he wasn't really athletic. He wasn't all muscled up and jacked up and so forth. He wasn't an ex wrestler turned manager. He was always been a manager uh, other than being a photographer, but in the official sense on TV, his role was that of a manager. And back in the era where managers had viability and they were useful. I've missed this before. Tony Khan grew up as a big wrestling fan. You know, he still is, but he, uh, he grew up in an era where he, he liked the interactions of a great manager, uh, to the, to their talents and to the TV audience and the role that they played in that era of his formative years of being a wrestling fan. And we're trying to revitalize that to some degree here in uh, AEW nowadays, but Cornette, that was his role. The rich kid, the spoiled rich kid, who's used to getting everything his way. He's spoiled. He's entitled all the things that the common Joe cannot deal with in a positive way. One of the things that, uh, he was doing when he first gets started is he's going to have these high profile clients. And I guess the story is they're going to fire him after one match because he does so badly. 
And that's the story, but Dutch Mantel, uh, the future one man gang, all these guys are sort of in on the gag and he's even going to work as a co-manager alongside Jimmy Hart in Memphis of July of 83. And that's where his career would change forever. And this has got to be a big deal for Cornette. I've heard him say over the years that he used to, you know, get the old satellite antenna on top of the roof and, and watch these great matches from Memphis. Jerry Lawler was his favorite wrestler. He grew up on Memphis wrestling and now to have the opportunity to work in that, in that territory and alongside Jimmy Hart, who was the premier manager in the territory, that's gotta be like a dream come true for a young Jim Cornette. Yeah. And it was because Jimmy Hart was really phen- phenomenal, fabulous, quite frankly, hall of fame guy. Uh, but the other thing, taking it back a little farther, you know, Cornette growing up there in Louisville, uh, in a single, uh, p- parent home, his father had, just, had passed away. Uh, he was raised by his mom, really, uh, really a beautiful lady, nice lady. Uh, and yeah, she could have a son like Jim Cornette. She was a very nice lady. Uh, but he, he lived in a geographical area where with the right twist of the television antenna, you could get TV out of Indianapolis. Right. In Cincinnati. So he was in a geographical area where he had the opportunity to watch a whole lot of wrestling. And you know that he did. So, uh, and the irony of that is going back and looking at it and the similarities that he had with Bobby Heenan was the fact that, you know, Bobby Heenan was in that Indian on that Indianapolis TV. So he got to see Bobby Heenan in Cornette's in teenage years. So Heenan had to be an influence had to be an influence, I think. And, uh, so Corny consumed all the product that he could and, and he, and he did, he, he, I don't know if he still does. I, I doubt it. He might, I don't know. I, I, we don't talk as much as we used to, obviously for no particular reason. It's just the way of the wrestling business. Sometimes, you know, you, you forget about the last time you talked to someone on the phone or you saw him at a card show or what have you. Uh, but in, in any event, he, he consumed all the wrestling that he could. And, and I think he worked cheap. He could get to TV. He made a lot of trips in Louisville to Memphis. And it's not, that's not like driving across town. He, and he, and he, he, he made an effort and his mother helped him. She was a transportation more often than not in those early, early years. So he's a interesting study to see what created the character. What, what, how did he evolve in this very unlikely role for someone with his background? And, and, uh, he, it wouldn't happen today. You don't see any 14 or 15 or 16 year old kids at ringside. No, uh, in a, in official capacity. So he got a break there. And again, a, a kid that, you know, Jerry Jarrett's been known for being somewhat frugal. And, uh, I think Cornette, uh, his, his, uh, his, the, the way he got paid was, uh, very favorable to the promoter. <laughs> you know, you mentioned a minute ago that, uh, you know, Jim's father passed away. And I think I heard once upon a time that Jim's dad, like, uh, ran the newspaper. And and I know that seems a little archaic now in, in, in sort of the information age where everybody's got an app on their phone that keeps them up to date. But once upon a time, if you controlled the newspaper, you controlled information for the whole area. And that had to be not only a a lucrative opportunity, but uh, a pretty powerful one as well. Yeah, it did. And it also motivated a young Jim Cornette to read. He, he has been known to be a vociferous reader and he likes writing. Hence, uh, his love of print and the spoken word, the, the written word, I guess better said, but, uh, you're right. His dad was, a uh, an executive at there at the, uh, in the Louisville paper, but you're right, Conrad before cable TV, cable news. CNN, all those things, the newspaper was the most important thing that you're going to source to get sports scores, politics, the weather, everything was in the morning paper. So, uh, it was a, a very influential scenario. Unlike today, again, folks are talking about a different generation, a different era, the era where the, you know, I, I can't, my grandfather taught me how to read when I was five. And, uh, but I, I love sports so much that I, he taught me how to read the sports pages. There you go. And I was reading uh, sports pages when I was five or six 
And then I was being able to figure batting averages out and things of that nature when I was probably seven or eight. But uh, then, then I discovered wrestling on television and, and my, a lot of my interests started shifting toward more of the entertainment side of pro wrestling than, uh, than, than sports, the mainstream sports, even though I still loved it, like football, I love still to this very day, but, uh, that was a the deal there. The newspaper was the center and Cornette's dad was very educated, very smart. And, 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 and Corny, I think took after his dad in a lot of ways. Let's talk about, uh, what's happening in his wrestling career here. Eventually Bill Watts, your old pal and Jerry Jarrett are going to make a trade. I guess Bill was looking to spice up mid South wrestling and Jared invited him to come down and watch his TV and see who he liked. And Bill selects Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson as the rock and roll express. And he also picks up a couple of singles wrestlers, Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton pairs them together with this brash young manager Cornette to form the midnight express. And Watts said at the time he was so obnoxious. I just wanted to slap him. And I knew he was instant box office. If he could get me that riled up, <laughs> what do you remember hearing about this story that, uh, bill goes down to Memphis and discovers what's going to be man. One of the all time great pairings. Yeah. I don't, it's hard to say that there are, there are better tag teams, especially heel tag teams, uh, than, uh, Dennis and Bobby. And they were just kind of working, getting booked when they could, uh, always great. But they were basically, unless it's an isolated program or two, they were in the support, support roles. They weren't on top of the card every single week. They weren't like Jerry Lawler, who was on top every week because he was a star of the territory. Uh, so they were, and so there, if you're not on top of the card and the houses are okay, they're not great. And you're getting preliminary pay. You're not making a whole lot of money. What Bill saw in those guys was a chance to get two highly skilled performers and Dennis and Bobby put them together and hope that they would have the chemistry to jail. And then the, the, uh, wild card was Cornette because Cornette had never really had managed some, but nothing to the degree, again, being the understudy for Jimmy Hart, he never got the spotlight and probably wasn't going to get the spotlight there in Memphis. As long as Jimmy Hart was on his role, which is for several, several years. So, uh, that was a wild card. Cowboy had a great eye for talent. He had a great feel for the game. He felt like Dennis and Bobby could, could be a, a really an outstanding tag team, but neither of neither Dennis or Bobby were known as great, uh, interviews, great, you know, promo guys, Dennis better than Bobby, but they weren't to the level that Watts was totally comfortable with, but then Cornette could talk circles around anybody that we had. And he was finally given an opportunity to, 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 to rise up in the card and be a main event guy. So that was the missing piece. How are they going to function as a unit and how will Cornette do in this role that, that demanded amazing responsibility and a commitment because he was young and he was unproven to a large degree and, and Cowboy just had the, the instinct that some way, somehow this is going to work and boy, it did. Yeah, it did. Did you, um, what's your role in this era with bill? I mean, would you have made that trip to Memphis or does he just sort of keep you abreast or what are you doing for him here? Well, I, I knew that he was going to go to Memphis with the express purpose of finding some new talent. And we had some talents that, uh, had been with us for a while that, you know, when you have a territory, the, one of the key things that promoters did was they would change talents as often as it was feasible, uh, to keep things new, fresh wrestling fans like new. We've said that before here. They like fresh, they like new concepts, and they especially like new talents uh, on their TV screen in a role that has some significance. So uh, uh, I, I just, I, but I was doing a lot of things for Bill at that time. I was writing, uh, I was placing his ad buys for radio for, for the live events. I was broadcasting everything from ring announcing to the interview inserts to uh, play by play. When Bill got tired of doing it, because for years, my role was the uh, welcome to mid South wrestling. Everybody I'm Jim Ross alongside the president of mid South cowboy, Bill Watts. And here's bill. Then the next time you'd hear me would be, 
Thanks for joining us, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> for Cowboy Bill Watts, I'm Jim Ross. Thanks so long, everyone. That kind of shit. So I was doing that. Uh, when we go on the road, I was the driver. I drove Cowboy around. Uh, I rolled his joints. Uh, what else did I do that was, that was tangible? Uh, he would ask me ideas about booking, which he he did one on one, and 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 because he some of the guys, the veteran main event guys, might not have appreciated my idea as much coming from me, right? The Green Kid, as it would coming from Cowboy. Obviously, he's the boss. He paid him, and nobody's going to have more of an influence. Uh, on the talents of mid South and then the owner and the booker and at, at times top baby face. So, uh, I was doing a variety of things and I was traveling with bill. I was sitting on that learning tree of the cowboy, which I use this very day, philosophies, concepts, relying on basic human emotion to get an angle over or to explain a character, a lot of those basic fundamental things that I've used for years and years came from bill Watts and his, uh, strict marching orders on how my product is going to be presented. So, uh, that was, I did a lot of things, but I did not, I did not make the trip to Memphis. Look, Conrad, that would have been another airplane ticket. You right. He's going to pay, pay for my fat ass to go with him to tag along. No, it costs money. If it had been a drive, I might've made it. I mean, he might've wanted me to go with him, but I didn't go on the trip, but I got reports going into the meeting. I got reports coming out of the meeting and started getting our house in order of who we're bringing in and, and how we're going to introduce them. And, you know, Bill had the idea with his uh, son, Joel, to do these great vignettes. And some of the vignettes had already been done. That's one great thing. People forget about the Memphis territory. You go back and think about those, those great vignettes with the, the fabs, Stan Lane and, and uh, uh, Steve Kern. They were great ahead of their time. There in Memphis, those vignettes, and Lawler uh, was a big catalyst of that. He, you know, those we talked about Kamala, and how Lawler created the character and the vignettes and the whole nine yards. Uh, they were ahead of their time there, so we want to follow that that trend that they were establishing by doing vignettes. And the lucky part for us is that Joel was very talented in editing and putting these things together. He was young. He was up on music, and of course, then in those days. We all used uh, popular music you did, without the ASCAP and BMI and all those things. You just, you did it until somebody caught your hand on it and you said, okay, I'm sorry. We won't do that anymore. Right. So, uh, that was kind of the deal there with, uh, with, with cowboy. He, he had that vision and look, we, we, we lost some, uh, uh, Memphis got some good talent too. So, uh, yeah, we was, should, uh, we should mention that it is a trade. I think Rick rude and Jim Neidhart go to Memphis. As part of this deal, is that yeah. right? That's correct. And, and look, there are two Hall of Fame guys. Yep. So it wasn't like it was a one-sided deal. Uh, they were more established than there were. There were. There was not a Midnight Express. Right. There was not a Jim Cornette managing the Midnight Express. It's, that's all new. That all happened in Mid South with Cowboys guidance and, and leadership. So uh, it was a. A, a very unusual thing that you'll never probably see again, because, you know, even though we had, uh, we've had, uh, uh, some talents at e in AEW that were, were, have been with other companies or Indies and things like that, like Thunder Rosa, for example, uh, the NWA women's champion, you know, those, that's a rare occasion. You got to have promotions, two promotions that are, have the same mindset, same level of cooperation, wanting to provide the best product for the fan as opposed to what's best politically or perception wise. So, uh, it was a, it was a bold move back then, uh, to have that much cooperation between two promotions. And I think the outside the box thinking that Jarrett and cowboy had is what, uh, what, uh, created that opportunity. They were not stuck in the past. They knew that things had to change with like the music vignettes and things of this nature. Uh, the various vignettes period to get talent over when we brought rock and roll in using the videos that were shot in Memphis. Uh, and we also, by the way, one, another key element of that trade was bill Dundee because Dundee became the booker. So, uh, I believe that he came in the whole deal. I think, I think he was there with that whole group. Let me clarify. And, bill Dundee is a, has been a staple in Memphis for a long, long time. 
And as part of this talent change or exchange and just sort of freshening things up, Bill goes from Memphis to mid South. And I think most people credit well, and that's probably a debate for another day, but a lot of people say, man, Bill just set the territory on fire for mid South, but some would criticize it and say, yeah, but he hot shot at everything. And there was nothing left when he was done. But the, the point of your story is this is the same quote unquote trade. Yeah. Dundee came along in the package and not to wrestle, even though he was a star, uh, arguably the number two star in the Memphis territory forever next to Lawler. And they had some amazing feuds and amazing matches. And, you know, I remember, remember Dundee and I used to ride together a lot. And he was telling about the angles they came up with that, uh, for example, uh, one was where Dundee lost his hair. And they do, they wouldn't extend the angle another round or so. So they put Dundee's wife's hair on the line. Things like that. Outrageous shit that worked, sold tickets. So Dundee was a big part of the Memphis scene. And the only thing that Bill was, he was never totally, look, Dundee it was a hell of a hand. Great storyteller. Uh, and he was, he wanted to still wrestle. And I think that Cowboy wanted us to be the booker, which is fact. And then eventually Dundee got some action because quite frankly, Dundee was a better worker, even though he was the booker, than a lot of our boys. Uh, he was really good, but, and he was, he wanted to wrestle, he could, you know, so, uh, Dundee helped make me a lot more money. I can tell you that Dundee came in and I don't know how I got the, maybe Dundee told me or, or I saw something in the office. For one year, Dundee made a hundred thousand dollars as the booker, and that was when that was a lot of money back in the eighties, Conrad. It's a lot of money now. Yeah, yeah, there it is, and uh, I agree. And he uh, and I was making probably sixty, maybe a grand a week, you know, fifty-two grand a year, or something, somewhere in a, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so I was making more money selling radio ads. Uh, you know, I was making really good money doing that, and. I told Bill, I said, I, I, I'm not going to try to get a raise. I'm not going to hold you up and all that bullshit. Cause I'd already heard all those stories and that's just not my philosophy. I said, but I can't stay here for this kind of money considering that a lot of the, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the things that we were doing, I helped contribute to. And you know, you got, and Dundee has earned his money, no doubt, but he can't, he should be making almost double what I'm making. Right. And, and cowboy agreed and he bumped me to a hundred grand. So, uh, two grand a week, 104,000 a year. So that was, uh, he took care of me. He saw my value. I proved and I earned my value back in the eighties. So, uh, that was kind of the deal, but Dundee was a key part of that trade. Of course, Dundee was, uh, Bobby Eaton's father-in-law. So, and he knew those guys, Bill knew the Dennis and Bobby and Ricky and Robert and all that Cornette, like the back of his hand. So a lot of the ideas that we utilized in mid South were what basically were, uh, reissued from Memphis. Some of the finishes, some of the ways to get shoot angles and stuff. And I never saw anything wrong with that because at that time, Conrad, they, neither one of those shows were involved in a cable national cable overlay. Yeah. If you, if you didn't live in that area, you'd never seen it, never seen it, never seen it. So that's kind of what we played on and. Uh, and, and it worked out r really, really well. It was a, almost an instant success, just about from day one, all the stars aligned. And because of the vignettes that we aired, uh, for example, uh, the rock and roll express were over on night one, right? Because we played, we played vignettes for, you know, some great topical music, you know, I love rock and roll and all these famous, all these, uh, popular songs that people were listening to on the radio became the theme songs of these wrestlers, whether it be legal or not, that's what happened. So, <laughs> you know, and, it, and it did in a lot of territories, you know, bad, to the ball, all these junkyard dogs, interest music, queen, you know, uh, another, another one, bites, another one bites the dust. Yeah. That was illegal as hell. Right. But no, but, but nobody, we were so obscure in our region, only in our region. We were not, we were not obscure in mid South, but we were obscure nationally. You flew under the radar. Oh, big time, big yeah. time. Well, let's talk about Cornette. You know, you guys 
are going to bring him in, put him with the midnight express or, or Condry and Eaton and create the midnight express and really become a thing here. What did you heard about Cornette before you met him either from bill industry trades, your friends in the other territories? What did you heard about Jimmy before you actually met him? Not that much, really not that much at all because he had a support role in Memphis. Uh, he, he, he had a cup of coffee here, there, and yawn in a main event scenarios, but he wasn't the manager in Memphis was Jimmy Hart in the story, everything else is second place or third place or whatever. So I had not heard that much about uh, Corny and until he, until he, uh, we, when he came now, when Bill signed him, I endeavored to, you know, either read the observer back in those days or, 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 or some, or talk to guys that knew him. Uh, and to try to find out more about him before he, he arrived in the territory. But until the first day we did interviews, I didn't know him whatsoever. I, I knew what he looked like. I knew, I knew what he sounded like. I knew he was, what he was going to do. But again, the unknown entity, the unknown variable was him as it related to Bobby and Dennis, because you could never, anybody that could have vision could see that Bobby and Dennis were great hands. They're right. outstanding workers. So again, can they, can they mesh as a, as a unit? And then how does their mouthpiece fit into the whole scenario? Can this guy do promos uh, well enough to sell tickets and to embellish his team? And the answer to that was obviously a resounding. Yes. When you first meet Jim, what's your impression of him? That he was very easy to dislike, uh, kind of hyper, uh, you know, just exuberant with his enthusiasm and his love of wrestling. Uh, but as a heel per persona, much like I told Paul Heyman, you know, you're really easy to dislike. And that's a great, tr I take that as a compliment because it's the greatest thing you say to a heel. You're very easy to, you're organically, naturally, very easy to dislike. So then that character is basically and only an extension of the true personality of the individual. So it's that it gives the fans less to see through. It's a, uh, it's very transparent. This guy's a spoiled kid. Uh, he, he's a young and brash and bold and almost feels entitled that he should have been had this spot long before now, all those type things. And it, and it came across that way very naturally. So instead of being worked, uh, uh, you felt like this guy was who he said he was. And to a large, large degree, Cornette was exactly, uh, you know, as he appeared to be. Uh, so it worked out very, very well, but I met him at, we did interviews at KTBS, uh, I said K cause it is in Shreveport, uh, and, uh, east of the west of the Mississippi. So the K's are there. And so he comes in and, uh, we're going to do a, uh, interview with, uh, the midnight introducing them. And it was going to play in one of the commercial breaks of our syndicated show. So, uh, uh, Bill says, go up there and, and get your team over. Talk about your team, talk about what they're going to do. Mention this team, this team, this team, or this star, this star, that star to establish you're a heel. And so, you know, Cornette was all excited as we all were to hear this first interview. So we go out there and it's a, it's a, I think a two minute, we had, we had three minute interviews. We had two, three minute segments, I think, and one, two minute segment. So the two minute segment was given to Cornette to go into the body of all the syndicated shows. And so he comes up there, uh, and I'm, I'm interviewing him. I'm sitting in a little high top chair behind a podium uh, with a backdrop behind us in this little TV studio. And, uh, he starts his promo. I introduced him, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jim Cornette, the manager of the midnight express, uh, Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton. They're going to be debuting soon in mid South. They're very highly regarded. So, so a, a benign, basically a benign, cause I didn't know what he was going to say. Right. I didn't want to step on his material. So I said a couple of things, got him in the deal. Then all of a sudden his promo starts out by saying he starts knocking my suit. Uh -huh. He starts knocking my haircut. He starts knocking my accent. He, he guts and quarters my ass and it's entertaining as shit. It was funnier than hell. 
very entertaining. And so we do the interview. And now, well, after you do an interview, and Cowboy's sitting there with his book open at his table, table and chair there in the studio, uh, he would, uh, he would, everybody would wait for the verdict. And so the verdict would be, if the Cowboy liked the interview, he'd say something like, good job, or that's not bad, or do this more, whatever. And uh, so he got through the interview, everybody's waiting on the verdict. And Cowboy said, well, that was an interview, all right. And it was the shits. Oh. It was the fucking shits. He said, I don't I said, I know what you may have done stuff like that. All, all Cornette was doing was impersonating uh, guys like uh, Lawler and others to Lance Russell. Mm. You know, of course, Lance is a beloved figure in Memphis. He and Dave Brown are a wonderful team, as good as it got, no doubt about it. And so they'd make fun of Lance's banana nose or whatever it may be. And that's what Lawler did for years as a heel. And he had great chemistry with Lance. Uh, so Cornette just followed what he learned. Cornette followed what he knew right. that, he thought, that he thought worked. So Cowboy says, the last thing that will ever happen in my territory is for you two fuckers to ever get in the ring and wrestle. Right. So you're cutting up. You did a two minute promo building a match between my announcer and my new manager that will never happen. So we're going to do that over. I want you to get your fucking team over. I want you to mention some stars in mid South that you're looking forward to, to, to beating the shit out of type thing. So Cornette, and he didn't have like, okay, he didn't, he didn't say, well, uh, go, go take a walk and, and, and I'll give you 10 minutes or five minutes to get, collect your thoughts. I mean, we did it right then, right there. There was the, in, the, the interlude was maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. So as it worked out, uh, Cornette comes back up there. We do the, inter- so I do the very same intro and he did a priceless promo. Amazing. As good as I fucking ever heard. He talked he dropped all the names of the talents that were on top, all the tag teams that were in, in, in the, in a territory. He put Dennis and Bobby over, uh, for their skills and their, all this other shit. So he comes back regroups and does an interview that knocks it completely out of the park. So now cowboy knows what he's got. He knows what his intuition told him he had, but that he needed somebody, he needed Cornette to, he needed leadership. He needed to be produced. So once Cornette got put on the, on the track that Watts wanted, he was, uh, he was, uh, absolutely amazing. I mean, the guys would always want to be at the TVs more often than not. They, they hung around to hear Cornette's interviews because he gave them ideas and his, his uh, storytelling ability and his promo ability was second to none. We had never had anybody si- since I'd been there, uh, for sure that do a promo as good as Cornette did. So he, uh, from day one, he became our best interview guy. And we had some really good interview guys, the guys were great storytellers, but nobody could touch his ability in that era whatsoever. We should also mention, as you're talking about how unbeatable he was as a promo, 22 years old, just turned 22 in September. He's coming in here in November, 22 years old. It's unreal to, to run across a guy who's that talented and that entertaining and has that much of a feel for the business at just 22 freaking years old. Is it not? Yeah. It, it, it reminds me of where we are right now with the MJF. Mm. He's 20, he's 23 years old. Right. And, and his skill set is well beyond his years, well beyond his years. So, and, and that's why this kid MJF is going to be such a star and a bigger star and as the days go on, uh, than he is today. And he's a big star. Now he may be the future of AEW in that respect, but nonetheless, when I see MJF create his own promos, create his own content, it reminds me of Jim Cornette. It reminds me of a young Paul Heyman. And those are both great examples. I right. think great, great comparisons, Conrad. Uh, so, whether you like their party affiliation or their political views, the fact that how good they are in that role is, is, uh, is amazing. But that's what, that's what it reminds me of. Cornette was like a, a uh, you know, way, be, way before MJS time, a, uh, 
He's MJF in that era, like Heyman was. So uh, I, I uh, it's, it is amazing. He's 22, 23 years old, but he was hungry, man. He felt like he already, he, he should have already been there. Right. That, that's the confidence he had in his ability. And when you're in pro wrestling and you're an independent contractor, if you don't have confidence in your ability, nobody else will. Right. But they'll see it like crazy. They'll see it right away. And, uh, but he had that, uh, that little swagger. Like I belong here. I belong in this role, but I don't know that he knew at that time that he would, would become uh, mid South's number one manager. And arguably, at least in my eyes, the greatest manager that ever, ever performed in mid South for cowboy. Well, walking into the territory, it's been said that midnight express and rock and roll express were amongst the smallest men in mid South. Do you remember any pushback from guys in the locker room about Hey man, these guys are too small. Of course, these days you hear that as a knock all the time, you know, with, with regard to, uh, well, maybe not as much as you did 10 or 20 years ago, but that was a thing back here in 83, the size of the guys and rock and roll and midnights while they're, you know, good sized boys. They're not the, the monsters of a, of a King Kong Bundy, or even as tall as a Ted DiBiase, or certainly not as big around as a junkyard dog or a, a hacksaw Jim Duggan. Was there pushback on, wait, what type of trade is this? There might've been silently or amongst themselves, uh, uh, people, you know, I wonder if Cowboys made the right call, but everybody who was making money with Cowboys creativity and his booking, uh, were willing to give it a shot. And the guys that had were familiar with the work of Ricky and Robert from Memphis and were familiar with the work of Bobby and Dennis from Memphis knew these son of a guns could go. It didn't, don't, don't worry about how much they weigh. Their, their skill set in the ring was absolutely astonishing. So the guys that knew had less uh, apprehension about it. The apprehensions, I would say, come in from, from the heels because of the competition that the Midnight Express, after they heard Cornette's promo and heard a few of those promos, uh, those guys are going to, they got to fight now a little harder for their spot. Right. So that might've been some pushback there in that regard, just competition wise. But I think as far as the size issue is concerned, I never heard it become an issue quite honestly, never become a de- big deal, but it was discussed. It's always going to be discussed. Sure. And, and look, I'm, I'm too hard on, uh, there's talents in, in AEW that I didn't have the utmost confidence that Tony Khan had in them, uh, because of their size. And OJR was wrong. I don't mind saying it. You know, I'm, I'm going to stand on ceremony here. Uh, because at the bottom, at the end of the day, how well do you perform bell to bell? And can you, can you put sentences together that encourage me to stay tuned or to come back? And we got a lot of smaller guys in AEW that can do that. I know one of the things Cornette's in today's world, today's Jim Cornette, thinks a lot of our guys are too small, too small. And I could understand his logic of where he's coming from, knowing his background. And I had some of those same tendencies in the early days of AEW, but they've been alleviated. I don't go to, ever go to work anymore saying, well, yeah, we got this match, these guys, and they're awful small. You know, bullshit. I've seen Ricky and Robert. I've seen Ricky Morton weighed maybe what? He didn't weigh 200 pounds. It's just amazing to me, though, I guess the irony of these days. And don't get me wrong. I love Cornette's podcast. I listen almost every week to the drive through but he would go on rants about how small the guys are. And I think once upon a time, they said that about, you know, his team and the team he was feuding with too. And I realized that, you know, the argument will be, yeah, but these guys are even smaller, but the point is it was, it was once a thing, but let's get back on track with Cornette. He has got nuclear heat almost right away. He knows how to play this heel persona. It's working like a charm to the point that fans are starting to actually attack him on his way to and from the ring. He even starts loading his tennis racket, the little famous zip up tennis racket cover. He starts sliding a horseshoe in there just in case. And we've heard about some of the craziness that happened over the years. Did anybody draw the kind of heat that Jim Cornette did? It feels like he had a knack for it. Like almost no one else. There may have been intervals, Conrad, where somebody got hot as a heel shot the right angle. And so for a interval of time, a period of time, <clears throat> pardon me, they had the same comparable heat, uh, but over consistently week in, week out, 
not a chance. He was the king of that. And uh, I remember one time in Tulsa, you know, Cowboy loved to have heat finishes. You know, there will be times where you have a long program with a, with a top heel and a top baby face. And the baby face might not get his hand raised till the blow off. Right. I mean, he might get a win by a DQ. He might get a win by a count out. But you didn't come in there and beat the heels very often in, in a way that would diminish their villainy. So, uh, and, and Bill was bad about that. He loved the heat and he would, and you had to be a tough son of a bitch and, and brave and bold and all that good stuff to, uh, withstand being booked in mid South. If you're a top heel, because he's going to load the heat on you. How can you, do you, will you handle it for appropriately? Can you withstand it? Because it, it's very likely going to get physical. Now, a story I will tell you happened in Tulsa. But to, to preface that, Louisiana, especially Southern Louisiana, the New Orleans, the Lake Charles, the Lafayette's, all those clubs down there, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, go Tigers, uh, Ed Orgeron, throw him in there. Good old Ed. Uh, he's one of your SEC boys. Yeah, he is. Go Tigers. Uh, he would, uh, that was where it got really gnarly. I mean, really gnarly. So, or sometimes the cops would call for backup. The security guys were all local cops. They weren't a uh, rent cops. They had guns, they had nightsticks and they used the nightsticks often to get fans off of heels. I remember one time I did a, re a referee deal where I didn't see the gimmick, the loaded glove or the, or a whatever. And the, and the hero got beat after it looked like he was going to win because the heel used a foreign object. So I didn't leave. I learned later on how to do that. You, you always leave with the heels because they had the most cops around them. And I left with the baby faces trying not to make good. I'm sorry. You know, and I got the shit beat out of me on the way back to the locker room. I got hit in the face, the, the ear, the arm, I was bruised. And the, I got back when I got the back, the guy said, you know, somebody has got to tell you, you, when you have a hot finish, you got to leave with the heels. Cause they got the cops with them. So I remember that that's for this night. That's when I saw, I was standing next to this fan or walking, trying to get away from him. He grabbed me again. The cop pulled his nightstick out, which was a pool cue, the fat end of a pool cue. Uh, and it had been hollowed, hollowed out, hollowed out with some, uh, some kind of lead or something in it. So it made it heavier, obviously. So it had a hole in it, had a little leather handle. You could put the little leather strap through it, hold it on your wrist. I heard the guy's arm break. It scared the dog shit out of this fat boy because he reached and grabbed me and he's already been pulled off of me once. My nose is bleeding. My eye was swelling up and this cop pulls his nightstick out and hits that sun mist right across the forearm. Crack. They say, can you cannot sometimes hear these bones cracking? I swear to God, it's true. And this guy pissed his pants, broke his arm, all these things. But I got to the locker room finally, and uh, the boys thought it was funny. You know, young kid, you know, 22, 23 years old at that time. But that was Southern Louisiana, man. So Cornette's leaving Tulsa, more ref a little more refined city, perhaps, one might uh, surmise. And some big old redneck, Oki, uh, was able to long arm to get his hand across the railing. Uh, and he hit Cornette square as square between the eyes as you could. It's like, it would be like hitting a tomato cause his nose splattered all over his face. There was blood everywhere. And I remember the story vividly. He gets, he gets in the back. God damn, kill the motherfucker. Son of a bitch. Let me have him. Let me have him. Like, okay. Easy now, tiger. <laughs> so cowboy was there. So cowboy peels Cornette away from the guy. And, and cause Bill had that rule. Remember you get your ass whipped by a, by a fan. So Cornette got a, he, had a, he, he didn't qualify for that, that rule. You get hit by the fan. You get your ass beat up rather uh, you're done. So he pulls Cornette off, sends him to the heel dressing room. So then cowboy takes the, uh, disciplinary action into his own hands, literally. And it beat the shit out of the guy oh. with the cops there, the city cops there. They just turned around and took the other way because cowboy was paid and they like bill. So that's the kind of heat we had there in that era. But it was all generated because of the ability of Bobby and Dennis to pull off a perfectly executed heel finish, the old heel screw job, 
and uh, and win by uh, unscrupulous means. So uh, that was just how it was. And it, it was finished like that night after night and on TV. The heels did they, the one thing Bill would do for the baby faces, he'd get them some wins on television. You had to. But when it came to the house shows and you're working returns and you're in Baton Rouge every Tuesday night, you got to get them to come back the next week. Or you're in New Orleans every Thursday night, you got to get them to come back the next week. And a lot of that was to pay to see the bad guys get their comeuppance and what they deserve. So it was a, it was a hell of a deal. But, but Cornette had more heat than anybody. Anybody. And that's why the matches that he was in, when he finally got into matches, and finally started doing angles with him, that's why they worked so successfully. One of the other things I'm excited to talk about is the first real hot angle that's going to draw major money with Cornette and the Midnight Express. They're going to be celebrating their tag team title victory that was interrupted by the Rock and Roll Express by shoving Cornette's cake or show Cornette's face in a cake. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime there's a cake in wrestling, somebody's face is going in it. Uh, yep. and, and Cornette gets hot about Bill Watts replaying it on TV. And then Watts is going to wind up slapping Cornette during a promo. Well, of course that can't go unchecked Cornette and the midnights bloody bill Watts. And that draws him out of retirement. And I know in theory, this seems like a simple angle, but man, in 84, this was a big deal. Was it not? Oh yeah. I was standing right there. Conrad, I was a microphone holder. I was the <clears throat> involved. I was there, uh, in the, on the scene, uh, didn't have a really didn't, wasn't sure how hot the angle was going to be. But you got to remember, you know, Watts has been on TV every week. He was the voice of reason. He was the, the chairman or the president of the company, president of Mid-South, as, as he was introduced every week. And so people loved him. He was a beloved figure. And when he'd make a ruling that would level the playing field after a babyface had been screwed around, the fans thought that was, you know, that's, that's the way you lead. That's the leadership. And he was a very, Bill was very outspoken on commentary, very logical. He pointed out things that you couldn't turn your head away from that were true as far as talking about the heels persona or baby faces persona. So Bill was <clears throat> that, that figure that had been around for a long time. I, I'll tell you this, go back and look at the attitude era when Vince McMahon became a performer, a talent. Uh, and he wasn't the, the announcer of Vince McMahon. He was a Mr. McMahon. Same scenario, uh, as far as being this beloved figure that was, you're comfortable with you, you, you're, you're very accustomed to hearing the voice. He's a part, he's a stable of the promotion. And that's what Bill was, what Vince was. So there's a lot of comparisons to that, that aspect. Well, cause I've said this many times, uh, we never had a better heel in the attitude era than Vince McMahon. I don't think this is my opinion. And, uh, because he was a catalyst to create the biggest star that we ever had there at Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it, it worked out. They kept drawing money. They kept drawing great ratings. So, uh, cowboy was beloved, but people know you didn't screw with him. He still was six, three and 300 pounds. He still looked decent. Uh, just a big guy, not a bodybuilder, but just a big man. Uh, as my granny would say, he was double shouldered, raw boned, all those cliches. And so and then of course, cowboy got the, the appropriate amount of color. He's bleeding. It's then it becomes more dramatic. You know, recently we had that match on TV where, uh, Sammy Guevara got bloodied up with Matt Hardy, uh, and in that uh, tables match, well, fuck, uh, it was, uh, it added to the drama. It added to the moment. And that was a big thing. So, uh, consequently, uh, that's cowboy got the color. And for a lot of these people, they've never seen Bill bleed. Here's our beloved leader, you know, the, the guy that always writes the wrongs. And now he's bleeding at the hands of three people, primary two, but Cornette was obviously involved. And, uh, it just, it was such an emotional angle that, uh, it, it electrified the territory and the results as I'm sure you have was, uh, pretty tremendous of how well that damn thing drew. It was money. It was big time money for us. We did. I know uh, and this may not sound like a lot of money today, but in that little territory, we had a, we had a $1 million week of, of, of live events and ticket sales. And in any, in anybody's game, even today, that's a lot of money, a lot of money. 
Do you think, but, do you think this angle would have worked with any other manager in the business at the time besides Cornette? I can't see it. I don't know. Maybe Heenan. Right. Maybe Heenan, but it took a special character to pull that off. And the other thing too, here's the thing that Cornette was smarter to understand, but he, he, he never wavered. He knew that he was going to become one of the most hated people in that whole region of the United States. Our TV ratings, you know, we were, we were getting shares that were double digits. We were getting ratings that were double digits. We were on network affiliates in spots that became later on spots for like Wheel of Fortune and, uh, oh, uh, Jeopardy, the prime access. So if the, if the news, if the, if the prime time was in central time zone, they start at seven o'clock. We're oftentimes on from six to seven great stations, network affiliates and prime prime spots, big audiences. So it wasn't going to be like it was a secret. It's on some obscure UHS station that you, that nobody could get. This was big time stuff. So, uh, but Cornette knew, Hey, your world's going to change here, pal. you ch- you know, the hotels you stayed at before, you might not want to stay there again. You might want to create a new path for yourself, uh, and be, be more, uh, obscure and, and, uh, and, and reserve back to back off the public side of that deal. So you wouldn't stay at the Hill hotel. Cowboy always had in, in the mid South territory. There was in every town, there was a designated Hill hotel and a designated Babyface hotel. And you, and, and the two should never cross. They would never cross. So you might not want to stay at the obligatory heel hotel where all the, the fans knew you were staying unless you relish getting your tires slashed or, you know, whatever vandalism on your vehicle or maybe worse. So think a lot, the world was going to change for Jim Cornette after that angle. But here's the thing. He knew it. He knew it puts him in a dangerous position. And some fans of today will have a hard time relating to what I'm saying here because you don't see that kind of heat today. There's no heel, uh, anywhere in the business that had the kind of heat that Cornette and the midnight express had right after shooting that angle, nobody. And that's not knocking the heels of today. It's not knocking the, the great stars that are, that are heels and th- who only wish that they had the free hand to do as much crazy shit that the midnight express did and the blood and the guts and the color, all those things. Uh, they don't have that opportunity nowadays, but they, they knew the world was changing, but along with that change was going to come a lot more money. And that's exactly what happened. We should mention when you're talking about a lot more money over the five weeks of doing the last stampede tour, they shatter attendance records at the Sam, Sam Houston Coliseum. Easy for me to say they shatter attendance records at the Sam Houston Coliseum, more than 20,000 in Tulsa and Oklahoma city in the same day and 23,000 at the Superdome. It leads right into the midnights and the rock and roll feud, which is going to lead to 1984, probably being the most successful year of mid South and really helped push the midnights and Cornette individually to superstardom. Do you think it was such a breakneck pace that he could really appreciate it? Or did he even recognize that he was such a big part of history and I mean, it's probably a lot for a 22, 23 year old to wrap your head around. Yeah. But you got to remember he had started photography and being around the business on an inside behind the curtain level when he was 14. Right. So he already had nine years of practical experience. Plus you're talking about a guy that was extremely bright, a really a, a legitimate and true student of the game. So I think he was aware of what they were doing because he'd watched so much wrestling. He'd seen angle shot before seen reactions of crowds, uh, and so forth. So, uh, he was, uh, I think he was quite aware of what was going on too smart, not to recognize it. Uh, but boy, it was, it was, it was something. And you know, cowboy never did dislike tag team wrestling, but he never had two teams that paired up. Uh, so it's, they were just in sync, right? Uh, they, he never had two teams like that before. They were that natural and very seldom did you, did you find that, you know, you can go back in time and look at, well, the Texas outlaws were big in the AWA, you know, they had uh, Ganya and they had Bach Winkle. They had great workers to work with too. Uh, you know, the heart foundation had some great teams to work with, no doubt about that, but it's just, it's just here, there, and yawn. It didn't happen on a regular basis. It wasn't an automatic. So I think that, uh, 
Cornette was very well aware of what they were what they were doing, the steps they were taking, and that 1984 year uh, was a fabulous year for all of us. You know, I made more money in that year thanks to the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express than I had ever made in the wrestling business because Cowboy took care of me when it was there. And then he would give me a booking every now and then. You know, some of those last stampede matches I refereed, uh, just based off the animosity that I would have with commentary toward Cornette and chastising him and, and uh, you know, how they cheated to win, blah, 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 all the stuff you're supposed to say. The Cowboy would give me a, a – it didn't, it didn't endear me to the other referees – Cause I would come in and work that one shot and work that one match. And, uh, you know, the stuff where we had matches for Cornette, if he lost, he had to wear a diaper or he had to wear a suck a baby bottle or, or whatever, wear a dress, things like that. I refereed a lot of those matches because Cowboy knew the house was going to be big. He could afford to pay another referee some money. And for me, uh, you know, when I broke in the wrestling business, Conrad making 25 to 40 bucks a night as a referee, uh, to go in there and make a hundred bucks. Shit, man. I was farting through silk. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about it. It feels like we've got now an established package here. Cornets and the midnights, arguably some of the best heels in 84. Certainly you could make arguments for other people uh, around the country, including Roddy Piper, but in this territory, certainly the hottest heels, but then they wind up leaving for world-class. What, what happened here? Was the travel getting to them? Were they unhappy with the payoffs from Watts or was it time to just freshen up and try new territory? I think it was a combination of several of those, those elements you mentioned, uh, time to freshen up probably was uh, in the equation. I think travel had a lot to do with it. You know, when you work the, uh, world-class territory travel was very, very, uh, compatible. You know, your two biggest clubs are adjacent to each other, Dallas and Fort Worth. So, and then all the spot shows around there that they ran off their big TVs, they had great television. They got great exposure. So markets that were not known as quote unquote wrestling towns, they became great spot show towns because they get the TVs boomed in their channel 11 out of Dallas, Fort Worth. And I think channel 39 where Keith Mitchell worked for a long time, our, our head of production. Uh, he was there in, you know, many of those formative years travel was so much easier. You, you had a little bit more of a life, uh, and you didn't have cowboy breathing down your neck because no matter how much we were winning, he was kind of like Belichick. Uh, okay. What about this week? You know, that kind of deal. I just think it was a freshen up a little bit. They'd done down there everything they could do. They'd done a lot of angles. You know, like I said, those matches, Cornette, much like Heenan made those matches where the manager was involved uh, more viable. They sold tickets, but you know, how many times do you go back to the well? So I think it was time to, to freshen up. They had a chance to make a lot of money. I know Cornette and I used to talk about them going to Dallas because it seemed to be inevitable. They're out, they're already living in that part of the country. Uh, you know, living in Louisiana to work that mid South territory. Uh, I think those guys probably live in Alexandria, I'm guessing. Uh, and then moving to Dallas was a it was compatibly compatible geographically, but he and I used to kid each other about the day that he would go to mid South or excuse me, go to world class and he gets to do his first promo on, uh, on the Von Eriks. He had a whole, he already then had a whole, a whole promo in his, in his mind. You know, he was going to compare them to the Cartwrights on the bonanza, the old TV show. You had Hoss, Carrie, you know, little Joe, Kevin, you know, Adam, David, and of course, Paul Fritz, and he had it all worked out and it was a brilliant frigging promo, man. So he, I think it was, we all thought it was inevitable that they'd go there, but we knew we thought they'd come back at some point in time after they could freshen up. So I think the freshening up part, it certainly didn't have anything to do with their work. They're, they're always great, but I think it's just a creative standpoint. Where do you, the, the, what do we do now? What's what can we do that's better than what we just did? And that was hard to figure out. So, uh, it, it was a, it was a, sh a shock, but I think it, it gave those guys a little bit of a break. Uh, the physicality in Dallas, according to what the boys would say was less than the physicality in mid South of what's watched demanded. And it was a little bit looser run. Cornette had a hand in all of his promos. Like he watched him in direction, but Corny come up with all that stuff. 
But in Dallas, the, the management, the creative structure was more loose, freer thinking, I guess maybe you could say. But uh, and but I think the travel, I think that's what you hit on that earlier. I think the travel and the fact they could exhale finally uh, was a big factor in them going there. We got to address the elephant in the room. Jim Cornette has become legendary for having these blow ups. Did you ever see one in, in, uh, the early days of mid South, or did you not see that until later with Jim Crockett or somewhere else? There weren't many blow ups, uh, public blow ups in mid South. There were some, but they weren't, uh, frequent and they didn't last long because that's not how the territory is run. It's, uh, it was, it's just not how it was going to work in Cowboys territory. He had rules, he had discipline and he had structure. And some guys adhered to it and it worked for them. They were, they used it to their advantage. And some guys were defiant and, and they had felt this, this esprit de corps of being more independent thinking. Uh, you know, I seen Cornette blow up, uh, you know, I sent him blow up in booking meetings and I sent him blow up in when, anytime he had to fly someplace, uh, <laughs> He, 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 he was, he was stressed out. I remember we had a, we had a TV in, uh, Halifax and you know, it's one of those deals where you can't get there from here. So I remember us leaving New York on a Saturday and I, we had to make one or two connections to get into Halifax. And of course that was just more airplanes and he just, he despised the airplanes. He's had a, he has a, he has, and he still does a bonafide fear of flying. A lot of people do. And he's not the only guy in the wrestling business that didn't like flying, but he, he detested it. It made him nauseous. It made him sick, physically ill. Quick story on that one. We're flying from Newark to, uh, uh, Seattle and to go do TV in Vancouver. That makes any sense. It kind of makes sense. The flights, Domestically, we're a little cheaper than the international because when, once you get to Seattle, it's a pretty easy drive to Vancouver. It's, it's doable. So, uh, we're in Newark and uh, the guy, uh, John Valdostri was a, was a, uh, Continental Airlines, uh, a representative and he would up, upgrade a lot of the guys. <clears throat> so he upgraded Cornette and I, he said, I'm going to upgrade you guys. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. It was a long flight you know, five or six hours where it was. And I said, uh, I'm thinking to myself, please, God, put us in separate seats. Don't put us in. And sure enough, uh, my least favorite seats on the airplane are the bulkhead. And so that's, we were in the bulkhead sitting next to each other. Mm. Oh, so then we go, he has got this ritual where he, he takes this uh, prescription medication to calm him down. And I'll use Xanax because I don't know any names of any other stuff, but, uh, he'd take like a Xanax and he'd take something else, but he took them. He had, he had to take them in a certain time limit interval. So he did. So the time we got on the plane and seated, buckled in to our, our first class bulkhead seats right. on continental air, he was already gone. So I remember the lady the flight attendant saying, does your friend want something to drink? And she started to reach over to shake him or to touch him. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. He's good. Uh, if he needs something, then we'll let you know, but thank you. I didn't want to wake him up. Hell, who knew how he was going to react? So it all works out real well, Conrad, until we get on the tarmac, right? I remember this vivid, like it was yesterday. The captain comes on and says, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, news from the, uh, air traffic control. Uh, we're 17th in line to take off 17th. Now what that does, it screams delay, delay, Will Robinson delay. And so he's sleeping through the whole damn thing. So all that works out real well, <clears throat> we finally take off and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that we're somewhere where, you know, mid, mid, the Midwest, maybe Minnesota, Dakota. So we had a couple hours left on the flight. And, uh, he wakes up. I want to know, are we almost there? The other, remember those, you know, those little monitors in front of your seats yeah. where you can judge your flight. Mm -hmm. He looks at that son of a bitch and I thought he was going to try to 
parachute out. So he said, you, you got to talk to me. You just got to talk to me. I said, what do you mean to say? I don't care. Just talk to me. So I talked to him, but what, what, what we're going to talk about football. He don't know anything about football. Talk about the booking. And we can't, we got a cafe. We can't talk about the booking. So finally I started singing to him. He said, just sing to me. Okay. And then I was singing for some reason, a Neil Young song. And uh, one of the lyrics was, I caught you knocking at my cellar door. And I think people thought we were gay. Uh -huh. Not there's not, there's anything wrong with that, but cellar door was a metaphor for something else. And, uh, so I sang to him, I told him stories. It's like telling a kid a bedtime story. So we finally got to Seattle and then to make matters worse, he demanded to drive. Mm. He's coming off this, this fog loopy. Oh, buddy. So I remember we rented the Lincoln or the Lincoln was rented for us. Big car. We cross over the border of Canada. And the, uh, the guys at the border recognized us. And, uh, of course they're, they're screwing around and they says, uh, you know, uh, we need to, we need to look in your trunk. Now I don't have any idea what Cornette was carrying in a suitcase. I know it wasn't drugs. It wasn't contraband. At least I didn't think so. And I, I still don't think so. But you know, he goes to this promo, you motherfuckers can't touch my shit. No one's going to touch my shit. Fuck you. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, this is good. So the guy looks at me because, you know, the good old JR is the voice of reason. And so I said, uh, I finally get him off to the side. And I say, look, you guys don't see what he's doing, do you? No, what's going on? He, I said, we, we can't have this kind of conduct. We're going to, you know, subdue him, put him in a, put him in a cell or something. With, you know, and I'm thinking, uh, I got to think of this quick now. Here's the deal. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, what you call a bad guy. He's a villain and he doesn't want to see you, you guys to see him out of character. So all he's doing is staying in character and trying to entertain you in his villain persona. Oh, oh ha, 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 I got it. Oh, I got it. <laughs> That's so good. So I, I, I thought I told, I've convinced him that even though he was shooting, he wasn't, he wasn't bullshitting that he was bullshitting. So, uh, God damn Dudley do right. Looking motherfuckers. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Dudley do right. Looking motherfuckers. I'll kill somebody. Okay. Easy. Now that's when I intervened with a little line about he's just in character. So uh, then we get to, we relive that about 30 times between Seattle and, and, uh, Vancouver. He's still in a fog cause this fear of flying and the medication he took to get there, get to work. And then we get about a block from the hotel. He wants to make a ride on red. And you know, have you ever been to Vancouver Conrad? No, it's a great place to visit. Really, truly is a beautiful city. It's very multicultural. There's a lot of, uh, different ethnicities that live there. It's a really cool town. Vancouver's a really cool town. Beautiful. But, uh, we stopped at a stop sign, stoplight. He wants to make a ride on red. And, uh, he didn't want to wait till the light changes so he can make the legal right. So he, he, but the people are walking, he starts cutting promos in every ethnic group that he could see. Now the winners are up, thank God. So no one hurt his me, but, but then he reared back in the seat. He put his feet on the steering wheel and started stomping the steering wheel, which you'd honk the horn, you know, incessantly. And he was stomping away, but he had finally had it. He'd gone as far as he could go. We made it for that. We, we finally got the turn on that red or make a right turn. I don't think it was ever, I think it all, I think it light had to turn green eventually. He's pissed off about the traffic laws, pissed off about the people walking by and uh, they didn't let us make our turn. And then I didn't see him again for like 24 hours. I think he went to sleep, uh, and, and just hibernated. He's the kind of guy that would go in a hotel and never allow the maids to come in his room. I don't want to touch my shit. They're going to touch my shit. I'm going to have it. That's his deal. So his travel was a big issue for him. But so when you, when you talk about the, the travel driving those 2000 plus miles a week, 
if you're a main event guy in mid south back in that era and you're working all the big clubs that would generally equate to about a 2000 plus miles a week drive so you just you're a road warrior not hawking animal just you're a real legit road warrior and so i think travel was always an issue there uh he didn't like getting out of his comfort zone and who does so uh i think that that was like you said earlier about him going to dallas part of the reason he went to dallas unlike the reason he went to charlotte because charlotte's gonna come back with a lot of travel but a t- chance to make a lot more money but uh that was the deal. He just travel was not his friend. Didn't like it. He had certain things. Places he wanted. He wanted to stop at Wendy's. He had. He had his. He had his way. Like Monsoon wanted to stop, you know, at Bob Evans. It's just the way it was. You're on the road so much, you get these habits. So he was a. He was not friendly to travel. And of course, now he didn't have to worry about. It. He's home in Louisville. He's got his business. And like you said, he, he's got a couple of really strong uh, podcasts that he he uh, produces. And. Uh, He's got his life now exactly the way he wants it. He does everything he wants to do from a wrestling business side of the coin out of his home in Louisville. And that's kind of, I think what he's always dreamed of being able to do. And now he's finally there. Well, before he got there, he had to bounce around a little bit, including a stopover with Jim Crockett promotions. And you actually joined Jim Crockett after Cornette and the midnights had already arrived. Did you think that Cornette had stepped his game up from when you first met him in mid South, or was he still the same great Cornette? Was he consistent the whole time? Or do you think he improved over the, over the years? Oh, he got, he kept getting better, uh, more experience, <clears throat> more reps. Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't quit becoming great. Uh, if anything, he, he kept getting better and he, cause he got his act down totally. It had been refined. Refined through Cowboy, refined, you know, starting with Jarrett and, and Lawler. But then the the big growth came in Mid-South, and then uh, working where he could pretty much call his shots creatively and, and things of that nature in, in world class. By the time he got to work for Dusty and Jimmy Crockett, uh, he was amazingly proficient and the kind of guy that didn't rest on his laurels, that wanted to get better. So I think he kept getting better. Uh, he was just at that point in time, Conrad, arguably he was by far the best manager in wrestling. I think, I mean, the only guy in that era that even compares to him was Heyman and Heyman didn't have the, the variety of experiences in the territories and a key role that, uh, that corny did. So I, I think he was, he, I think he was proud of the fact that he was considered the best manager in wrestling. And was not going to let anything happen to unsurp uh, his positioning within the business. Cornette becomes your partner in 1989. He joins you in the booth for Saturday night. Whose idea was it for Cornette to join you? What do you think of the move, and how do you think he did? <clears throat> I've always said that Corny was one of my best partners ever. He was a natural. We had that great uh, chemistry from a friendship and from a familiarity standpoint that we developed in in, uh, in mid South, uh, it was absolutely no surprise to me. He was going to be great at that role. He's like any other wrestler. Sometimes you got to back them off a little bit, learn to speak in sound bites a little bit more proficiently and more frequently instead of doing a promo, uh, or bringing everything back around to their guys, instead of getting everybody over that you can, even baby faces, you're a heel, uh, re- he refined that game. But it didn't take him long to do it. That's how quick a study he was. Brilliant student of the game. I, th- I think I helped him. I think he helped me. Uh, but it was a natural fit. Some of the best shows that, that I've done uh, in my uh, career were with Cornette as a, my color commentator. And he just was, he never missed, man. He got it. He understood the concept of every match has got a, an end story. Every match you see on television today has a, a, a bottom line, as Stone Cold would say. Well, there's no way he started out as just your best partner ever. What were some things that were tough for him in the transition from being a manager to being a broadcaster that maybe you had to coach him up on some of the finer points that you had discovered from doing it for so long? I think <clears throat> just talking in uh, run on sentences, mm. I think not, not, <clears throat> not being able to pull off the sound bites. Uh, you know, I, I encourage all the color guys I work with, <clears throat> pardon me. If, 
what you should try to strive to do is to, if you're going to talk in sound bites, and I told this to sportscasters, a lot of guys that I've met asked me pointers. If you're a color analyst, even a college football game, I told guys this to work on a national basis. You've got to give me the meat of the story first. And then if you've got time, you can back it up. So in other words, <clears throat> very basic example would be uh, Steve Austin's Steve Austin's arguably the greatest talent, the greatest wrestler of all time. Now, if you got time, you've made your declarative statement. If you have time within what's going on in the ring to back that up with why you think that, then do that, do it then. But don't do it first. Do it second. Say your definitive statement as a soundbite guy, color guy, because you're going to get in, and you're going to get out. And if we do that uh, with enough continuity, you'll be able to back that up throughout the show or throughout this match. So I think that was that is the same thing. A lot of guys have, especially a great talker. He's got so much to say that you can't say it in one breath. Right. So, so give it to me a little shorter and I want to, I'm going to, I'm the point guard here. I want to get you the ball back just in a second. And so we finally got that chemistry. So that was a, the main thing. It certainly had nothing to do with his ability to, to interpret a match or to understand a storyline, things of that nature at all. He, he got that. He knew that like the back of his hand, but just the fundamental rudimentary things of broadcasting of where you need to talk in sound bites, get in and get out. And that way you can get more content in than uh, these run on sentences, uh, was not good. So the, the sound bite thing was probably the biggest issue. And then, you know, being able to make, always have, he was so good at being a heel, endorsing the heels almost predictably that sometimes he might be, could be, uh, accused of not helping get the baby faces over cause you heel, God damn it. But you could be, uh, he got there. He got, he, he was able to do that in his own heel style. He became very proficient at, uh, putting over baby faces, not necessarily endorsing the baby faces, but pointing out their positives. And you, that, that's a better deal. You, uh, trying to sell somebody with double negatives. It's like saying, well, JR was a pretty good high school football player. He was awful slow. And, you know, of course, he, and, and, and he was fat. You know, that, that ain't going to work. Double negatives. You always got to balance it out. So that was one, one small issue. But I think the soundbite factor was probably the biggest one of all. Let's talk about him as a booker. Believe it or not, around this same time, he's not only going to get behind the mic, but he's going to grab a pencil and join the booking committee in WCW. You know, this is, uh, quite the evolution for Mr. Cornette going from taking ringside photographs to being a ring announcer, to being a manager, to being the most over heel manager, to now an on camera analyst, color commentator, if you will. But now he's part of the booking committee. What do you remember about corny being a part of that group? Like a lot of guys, uh, alpha males, we had, we had a lot of alpha males in the booking committee. Never thought it was a good setup for us. Thought it was a system built for failure by and large. Everybody has agendas, uh, whether they want to admit it or not, or whether they want to perpetuate it or not. It's just human nature. It's going to happen. So uh, I think that was one of the issues of the booking committee in general. But as a rule, when Cornette was in his booking meetings, you know, I got a—he's probably the smartest guy in the room. You know, uh, same thing that, that were, that created Heyman's fallout, uh, within the booking committee's perception of him was the fact that Heyman had great ideas and he had a very brilliant mind and Cornette was the same way, uh, in a different presentation, of course. Uh, and, but I think he, like a lot of guys, he, he couldn't sometimes understand why others couldn't see his logic on certain angles. And so I think that was the only thing there, but by and large, I mean, if somebody else had an idea they were really strong on and the committee wanted to do Cornette was able to add to that idea, contribute to it. It may not have been his original idea and it may not even be what he would want to do if he had the complete autonomy, but he was always able to add something to it to make it a little bit better. But, uh, the, the committee was unhinged and, you know, by and large, it had a very poor leadership, not all the time, 
but more often than not. And again, those uh, individual agendas popping up uh, were always a, an issue to deal with. It's hard to explain to a talent why you're not getting a break when somebody's on the booking committee's friend is. Right. It, it, it's just a scenario you don't. I, thank God in AEW, we got one guy that does it. You know, Tony Khan writes television. And he, he knows what he wants to do. And, and he, he does communicate with the talents and they are there. They have a hand in the creativity without a doubt. My God, Chris Jericho's all over his creative. And, but that's the deal. Corny was just always, he, if he wasn't the smartest guy in the room, I don't know who was, but uh, that was just, sometimes you gotta learn to play well with others. And that's not always easy. Cornette is well known for his thoughts on Jim Hurd. Were you ever in the room for any of those heated discussions Did he ever use you as a sounding board? Because it feels like you, uh, were sort of Jim's only pal after hours. And I'm sure a lot of folks came to you with their grievances or gripes. Was Corey the among them? All the time, Conrad. Uh, yeah, I was the guy that lived there of oh, the booking committee. I can't, I'm trying to think of there are a lot of the guys in the booking committee that li- actually lived in Atlanta. So I used to say this to those guys all the time. I said, you know, you guys, uh, we, we end a meeting without finishing what we really are, are, are intended to talk about so you can make your flights home. And uh, you're left, you leave my ass here with her. So your perception that I'm Herd's boy is so full of shit right. that it's not even funny because I'm the one left. Who else are you going to go commiserate with? Who else are you going to go bitch at? Why are we doing this? God damn it. Why are we doing it? I don't know. Uh, uh, I'll, here's, what I, here's what the committee would like to do. Well, the committee's full of shit. I'm not doing it. You can tell them all I'm not doing it. Okay, I'll get right on that. So I got to be the bearer of a lot of bad news, which created unnecessary heat on me simply because I was a messenger. You know, I said, you some bitch ought to live here. You live here to share this goddamn wealth of, of camaraderie that I have from our boss. Heard had no product knowledge and Cornette didn't have time or the patience better said to be willing to teach him or to travel along with that journey and help him along the way. Heard's ideas are so crazy at times. Heard wanted us to be WWE light. He wanted more entertainment than wrestling. And the booking committee, including and especially Cornette, didn't have a lot of time for that. He wanted wrestling, hard hitting, believable uh, wrestling. And and when we deviated from that with a ding dong or the uh, or the hunchbacks or you know stuff like that or screwing with Rick, you know that's like saying to Mickey Mantle, Hey, look, Mick, I know you're the greatest switch hitter in the history of baseball, but we want you to quit hitting from the left side. Why? We just, I don't know. Just think it's the right thing to do. It's just, irra- it's irrational. It makes no sense. So, uh, but they had a lot of blowups in that, in that deal. Cornette would knew when to back off because he didn't want to say something, get fired around the spot. Uh, I'm sure even though he probably felt like saying things, but he would take it farther than anybody else on the committee. As far as I can recall, uh, cause he had no, he had, no issue debating. He's very, he, he likes controversy as we know today on his podcast. He likes controversy. Oh, he likes it. Like it might not be the right word. He embraces it sometimes. Yes. He doesn't shy away from it. I right. guess it's a better way of putting it, Conrad. So yeah, they had some blow ups. Just end up just being cussing matches without being, well, you're a, you're an MF and you're this and you're, it just, you no, know, no patience. Either guy, either side had no patience, but as far as talking about the, the, product of pro wrestling Cornette was light years ahead of where Jim, Jim Hurd was or would, or would ever be. Corny winds up quitting after uh, Halloween havoc, 1990. Did you know this was coming or was it rather sudden? Well, I didn't know it was coming specifically, but it, but it happening didn't, was not a shock. He wasn't happy, very, very frustrated. And, uh, that character that he portrayed that kind of spoiled guy that had to have his way in a, in a, in a different context was still prevalent. He didn't take no very well. Uh, he didn't understand why Heard couldn't understand the, the basics of wrestling that we were defying. And so, yeah, I, I wasn't shocked. I didn't know what was happening. Like I said, I didn't know what was happening on a specific day, but the fact that it was going to happen eventually, uh, was pretty well predicted. He winds up starting Smoky Mountain Wrestling in 1991. Did he ever freestyle the idea of creating his own promotion to you? Or is this something that he doesn't really even think about until after he's out of WCW? 
I think he was, had the idea because Knoxville was always the destination. Uh, he had a chance to get TV in Knoxville. And at, at one point, Knoxville was the center of a very thriving territory that did real well uh, for different, at different times. Good, nice territory. Trips are, were doable without killing you and taking away all your family time because you're behind the wheel. Uh, so I think he always had that idea because it was a perfect scenario for him. He could be his own boss. He wouldn't have a booking committee. He didn't have to go through channels to get something done. Uh, he didn't have to appease a, a multitude of people to get something happen, to get, make something happen. So I think it was the ideal thing for him. It's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's challenging to do, uh, financially. You got a bankroll this damn thing. He has some, he has some partners. Uh, I think Rick Rubin was one of his partners, I believe if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Music, music guy. So, uh, uh, I, I just think that in the back of his mind, he probably had the thoughts of something like this. If I ever have a chance to have my own territory and do it the way I want to do it, by God, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Come hell or high water, no matter what it does. And that's, and he did that. It was a bold move, uh, because it's just not easy to perpetuate uh, a territory and make it successful. Well, let's fast forward 1993, believe it or not, your paths crossed for the third time. He's going to come into the WWF. Of course, you debuted at WrestleMania nine. He comes in to manage the heavenly bodies. Eventually he becomes the voice of Yokozuna along with Mr. Fuji. Did you ever think you'd see the day where, where Cornette came to work for Vince McMahon? No, I didn't. And also back up a half a step. I became, uh, uh, uh he used Bob Cottle a lot in the, in Smoky mountain the travel was a little tough, tough for Bob driving from Raleigh. Uh, and so I was living in Atlanta probably, I think it was on another one of my sabbaticals. And, uh, so I just, I did a lot of the shows for him play by play with, uh, Les Thatcher, who I love working with. Good guy. I understand the business, great pipes, always good to work with Les. total pro. And then when I went back to work for WWF for Vince, Vince, then what he endorsed me to continue to work for, uh, Cornette to the point that Vince was supplementing my income, uh, and without Cornette having to pay me. So, I mean, there was a point in time there where, uh, I didn't take any money from Corny because I loved the guy and I respected him and I enjoyed being around him. I loved his passion. I loved his exuberance. It's fun to be around in that regard. Uh, but, uh, I was happy to do it. It's fun. And it was really fun for me. It was old school stuff. So, uh, I, I enjoyed that, that tenure, my little short run there with, uh, with Smoky Mountain. And, you know, someday maybe we can do a, a watch along. They had a big show in Knoxville. Uh, you may have done it with somebody else already. I'm not sure. No, I haven't, but that might be a nice, a nice watch along for our fans. Cause it's, I think it's on the network. I think it's on WWE network, I think. And it's certainly available in, uh, on YouTube, but it was a big loaded show, a lot of star power. He brought a lot of guys in and even, uh, even in the era of, uh, when he was running his territory, uh, we would book talent. Uh, like I know undertaker was booked there a few times. I think Austin maybe made a shot or two at Smoky Mountain on the big shows. I'm not sure. Seemed like he did. So we were cooperating there because again, for Vince, it was another, it's kind of like the ECW deal. There were talents there that were good. And at some point in time, we might be able to hire them full time for us. And especially, and you did you know, remember, Tammy, yeah. Chris, a lot of those folks, you know, Kane. Bob, yeah. Brian Lee, you know, who was the fake undertaker in the WWF. He was also in Smoky mountain. I actually thought though, that you didn't go to Smoky mountain until 94. I might have that wrong, but I thought you had been with the WWF got let go. Your old pal, Jimmy said, Hey, why don't you come do some Smoky mountain stuff? And then you wound up going back. Did I have that timeline messed up? Did you go no, there? You probably, you probably got it right. I don't, those dates, you know, going back and so what year was that? Right. It's hard to recall, remember exact dates. All I remember is, is that. There was a level of cooperation with, uh, uh, as it evolved with Vince and Corny, uh, we got him some talents, uh, and running some top guys and help draw houses. And, uh, but it may have been Conrad. You may be, I think you're probably right. To be honest with you. Uh, 94 seems to be exactly <laughs> right. So in, in any event, it was, uh, I enjoyed those trips. They're long car trips for me to, to get there, but you know, nonetheless, uh, it was a fun, there were fun trips. Never stayed overnight, never stayed in a hotel 
ever. There was no catering. There was no, it was just nuts and bolts show up, you know, Cornette would sit down with him and tell you, tell you what he's going to do tonight. And we'd do, usually do a couple of shows, uh, get two shows in a can. And he was always well organized, had everything written out. Uh, he was, he was really a good producer in that respect. So, but 94 sounds about right. Now that I think back on it. It's also interesting. You know, I know that the ECW thing is going to become real in 96 when you guys start having a quote unquote working relationship, but here, you know, Jim Cornette is in the company and the WWF as a representative of Smoky mountain, he's managing the heavenly bodies. And he's also managing the WWF champion, Yokozuna. This is not par for course for Vince. Why was he so anxious to make an exception for Jim Cornette where he probably wouldn't have anywhere else? Because of Yokozuna, Yokozuna was earmarked to be a major star, a major player. You know, his size, the, the gimmick, uh, you know, his, his DNA, you know, Yoko was as athletic, uh, a, 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 a people say, Oh my God, Jerry, are you crazy? He was over 500 pounds and he had amazing athletic timing, the timing. Uh, so he had good instincts. So this knew that he had a gold mine potentially with Yoko Zuna, but he would never get to the level that. Yoko needed to be with Mr. Fuji being his mouthpiece. That was never Fuji's strength. Cornette fit that role perfectly. Fuji stayed as the handler, you know, uh, the, the other attendant, but Cornette was the quote unquote boss. Cornette was the manager. He was the head of the team type deal. And, uh, and then he, he did the same thing. Uh, who did he manage in the tag teams? Owen and Davey. Yeah. He would eventually manage them as well, but heavenly bodies and. Um, I, I, I guess we should also talk about this survivor series. 93, there's a tag match between the rock and roll express and heavenly bodies. What a change of pace this is for the WWF to acknowledge another promotion like this. I mean, I guess this just says a lot about the relationship Vince and Cornette had and the trust that went both ways. Yeah. And the fact that Vince knew that both those teams were outstanding, right? It was a fresh match. That was not, was going to be a great match or a solid match. It was not going to embarrass you. They're fundamentally sound. They're great storytellers. And so that's why that booking came about. Cornet's uh, influence obviously was huge. Uh, but the fact that Vince knew, and you know, he had guys around him, uh, myself, you know, Bruce that knew how good those teams were. And, you know, we endorsed them wholeheartedly. I think there's that I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, I think, I think Monsoon and I, that was the only match we called on that show because we had, I had the familiarity with both teams and gorilla was more than willing to, to do his thing. And I'd give him some, some, uh, bullet points on the teams. He got the, he got the drift very easily, but it seemed like that was a match that he and I did together. Uh, and it was a good opportunity for those guys. It got them in front of a bunch of new eyes, uh, new fans, and they didn't disappoint whatsoever. Let's talk about 94. You're out of the WWF, but Cornette has his Madison square garden debut at WrestleMania 10, even though Cornette, maybe, you know, the New York style of wrestling wasn't his absolute favorite. My goodness, WrestleMania and Madison square garden. It didn't get any bigger than that. Was that that big of a deal to Jim Cornette or was he sort of old school and thought, nah, it ain't Greensboro or whatever. He might say that publicly and use that exact illustration. Uh, it's not the Louisville garden on a sold out night. It's not Greensboro at the Coliseum, but don't make no mistake. Any talent in any era that can go into a major show, uh, in WWF on a major pay-per-view is going to be very grateful for the opportunity. And then you add the fact that it's in the garden money. It's a dream country for a lot of guys. Certainly was for me to broadcast the first time from the garden. And Cornette was, uh, I got to believe that he was excited about that opportunity because he knew the heritage of the garden. He knew the title changes. He knew the Bruno San Martino legacy, you know, all these guys, that Bob Backlund's run, all this great things that, you know, when stars would come into the WWF, WWF, 
how many W's you want to throw in there, uh, that it it, 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 it it was a highlight of their career, by and large. Now, of course, a lot of them left there pissed off because they couldn't stay longer or they, you know, either cash or creative bit them in the ass. But to work the garden on a major event, especially the 10th WrestleMania, a headline by Owen and Brett, uh, the latter match with the Razor and Sean, among other things on that card, uh, had to be a highlight for him. And I, I would bet my black hat right now in a case of barbecue sauce that there's no doubt in my mind that if, if, uh, if questioned correctly, he would tell you the same thing. It was a big thrill to work the garden and something of significance. We mentioned you weren't in the company at the time, but you are becoming a part of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. That sort, that whole promotion felt like a throwback to the old territory days. Did you see any similarities with his management style and his vision for wrestling to your old mentor, the cowboy? Absolutely. Yeah. Cornette learned a lot from everybody he worked for. He learned how to do things the right way and how what things that not to do. But yeah, he had a lot of the same traits that I saw from cowboy. He also had to have heat. If you don't have heat, you you don't have the, the, the product that you would ideally like as a rule. Heel heat is imperative. He had no issues with that whatsoever. Uh, and but he also knew how to make a baby face. And so he did a great stuff. Uh, he, that's where I, that's where I got really familiar with the, the, the late Bob Armstrong. Cause Bob was, uh, a, a, a figurehead president or something like that in, in Smoky mountain. And then he'd work into an angle with Cornette and they, and it sold tickets and it, and it worked. But yeah, there's a lot of similarities, basic fundamental similarities, no different than if you hired a football coach and they stress blocking and tackling. That's Cornette's deal. He was very fundamentally, uh, uh, consistent as best he could be based on the talents he could solicit for the, for the money that he could pay in that little territory. They had a lot of the same, and that's what he wanted. He wanted a legitimate, authentic wrestling territory. And there, there was an inter- interval of time there where he was exactly getting what he wanted, but it all depended on talent. And again, that's a, that's a kiss of death. You know, you got to continue to change talents. A lot of talents didn't want to come in and make the, the car trips. They were leery of the money, uh, things of that nature. So, uh, but yeah, he, he, he built a territory in with his own philosophy and his own image. Ultimately, Smoky Mountain's going to shut it down and, uh, he's going to be back in the WWF full time. So are you, um, what else was Jim doing when he comes back full time? Once Smoky Mountain's done, he's also a, an on-screen heel manager still as we've established, but he's got a role behind the scenes. He's doing some booking or is he part of Vince's think tank or what was his official title at the time? He was, he was involved in creative. He was involved in writing television, coming up with ideas, sitting in on those creative meetings, uh, and, and, and contributing in that regard. You know, he's again, he still had the same basic personality. Sometimes he didn't take no or, or rejection. Well, like all of us, quite frankly, uh, so yeah, he, he helped write television somewhere. So those good TVs in that era, uh, he contributed greatly to. Well, he certainly knew, you know, what, when, and how to handle Vince McMahon, but the other Vince, I think this is where him and Vince Russo started to butt heads a little bit and maybe even Kevin Dunn. Uh, it does feel like for whatever reason, Kevin Dunn and Vince Russo are near the top of Jim Cornette's shit list. Can you tell us about either one of those situations, actual situations you recall that maybe, uh, come to mind when you think about those two, not really getting along. Well, I can count my blessings. The fact that I was not involved to any large degree, uh, on the, on the creative, uh, I was glad that, uh, Vince didn't saddle me with that as well. I was in a lot of those meetings Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't my day to day gig. Uh, I was more, uh, more diversified, shall we say, cause I was doing a lot of work with JJ, uh, which would eventually see me taking when JJ left after he got his pay cut, we all did. Uh, in their wrestling side, JJ couldn't live on what Vince was going to pay him. And JJ had a special needs son and, you know, uh, three kids, and it was just more he could handle. So he, he quit. I think Bruce and I were in South Africa, believe it or not, when that went down, doing a show there for, uh, one of the national sports networks, cable networks. Uh, but, uh, corny 
and Russo were never going to get along because they were so seemingly. Now, I may be wrong about my evaluation of this or description of it. They just, they're diametrically opposed in philosophy. It doesn't mean one guy was always right or one guy was always wrong. It just means they were very, very different. And they were both were very strong personalities. And they were both uh, very headstrong. And so they were never going to get along. Kevin Dunn basically liked the entertainment side of uh, the presentation of wrestling. Maybe more than he liked wrestling. Uh, what you find that out a lot in that company, especially the, so I remember in that we had that meeting in Halifax and, uh, that TV, we get there on Saturday. We don't do raw till Monday. So we got all day on, on Sunday to, you know, to, to do whatever, but we ended up having a big, you know, we knew we were going to have a big TV meeting to do our, to, to format our televisions. And Kevin Dunn said something in the meeting. It seemed to be kind of mundane to me, but I don't remember exactly what it was. It didn't, it wasn't something that stuck, that stuck in my mind. And, and Cornette jumps up out of his chair, sit across to Kevin and like lunges over the, like lunges at him. You know, you goddamn Bucky Beaver looking motherfucker. I'll kill you. Okay. So then Vince looks at me like, Hey, I didn't, you, you hired him. I didn't bring him in. He's ain't my guy. Right. So I had to take Cornette you know, I went to his room and God damn corny. You can't, you can't do that, man. You're, you're taking a bat out of your hands. So, uh, he just didn't, he, he had an outburst. And, and again, you got to remember he's been on three airplanes in the last 24 hours. Right. And if you don't have a fear of flying, you probably won't relate to that. Well, he shouldn't have done that. He should, well, of course he shouldn't have done that. God damn it. I ain't got to be the valedictorian in my class to figure that out. Yeah, I know he should have done that. Nobody should do those things. The outburst in a, in a meeting, it was embarrassing. There are people in the production side that weren't aware of all these little idiosyncrasies that uh, we had on the wrestling side. It made us look a little bit archaic and, and uh, you know, a little strange, maybe. So, you know, that was, so that was, so after that moment, they were never on the same page. And the thing about it is, it's like this very day, uh, Kevin Dunn has become a, a multi multi-millionaire working for WWE, which is good for him. I don't have any, that's not a knock by the way, but he's Vince's right hand guy. And he was Vince's right hand guy then. So when you get on the wrong side of the right hand guy, uh, other than being coming left-handed, you're screwed because there's no net. There's nobody to bail you out or so. Well, he's got a, but he has some good ideas. There just wasn't that way. So Corny didn't do himself any favors on that one. But again, I look back at the real story and where we just, we basically discount the fact that the guy is so fear has so much fear of flying. It, it makes him physically ill. Right. And he doesn't heal in 24 hours. You know, he'd get off the road in the WWE and you wouldn't hear from him for a day or two because he was sleeping, chilling, thawing out, decompressing, whatever the word you want to use. So he had some, he had issues there. I, I wasn't in enough meetings with, uh, uh, with Russo and Cornette together to give you a chapter and verse other than it just was inevitable. You know, Vince from Long Island, uh, you know, he, he only grew up knew, knowing one kind of wrestling. That was a WWWF. That was the, that was the be all end all to, in his world. Nothing else counted. Uh, and Cornette was, had that diverse background from, having that big TV antenna there in Louisville, watching all kinds of wrestling growing up. So it just was, it, it was a, it was a bad mix, unfortunately, in hindsight, in hindsight now, a bad mix. If they all could have got along, there's no telling what that team uh, could have accomplished because yes, some very smart product, knowledgeable people, especially within their own little, little areas of expertise. It's just unfortunate it didn't work out that way. Cornette is on camera as the top heel manager here, managing Yokozuna, Owen Hart, Davy Boy Smith, amongst others. Of course, he even manages Big Van Vader. I got to tell you, the Vader pairing to me was just tremendous. And I know there was great stuff with like in 96 when they did Sean and Davy Boy. Cornette was doing some of his best promo work, maybe of his career at the time. 
But man, when they put him with Vader, I don't know why, but that really, really worked for me. And in real life, I'm sure Corny was a big fan of what Vader did in WCW. Oh yeah, absolutely. He he looked he wanted to manage Leon, Leon White, aka Vader. I thought that was a great combination. I thought it was a great combination. I really did. And uh, and and it just uh, it fit. It fits like we were talking earlier about uh, Heyman and uh, Roman Reigns. It, the early going here, it seems like it's gonna it's a fit, and, and at least they got a fighting chance to get Roman over as a viable something. Not is he a tweener? Is he a fa- fan favorite? Is he a villain? You know, we know pretty much what he's going to be with with uh, Heyman, and the fact that uh, even though Leon thought he was a great promo guy, he was so, he was he was solid, no doubt. But he wasn't the promo guy that Cornette could be. Right. And Cornette, Cornette could put Vader over much better than, than Leon could put himself over. So I, I like that marriage. It seemed like it worked to me. No doubt. And by the way, if you're going to be the top heel in 96 or the top heel manager across the ring from you, a lot is going to be Shawn Michaels. Of course, Shawn had a feud with Vader and with Davey boy. Of course, both of those times, uh, Corny's going to be in the opposite corner. And it's felt like over the years that Corny has sort of peeled back the curtain to say he didn't really get along with Sean. Didn't like Sean's attitude, the way he handled his business. What do you remember about that rather contentious relationship? Well, a lot of people didn't get along with Sean. Uh, I think in behind the scenes, probably more people did not get along with Sean in, in that particular area of, in time in Sean's life than did. The reason that Sean was given so many opportunities and multiple chances. It was because Vince saw a little bit of himself in Shawn Michaels, as far as his, his attitude, his demeanor, his cockiness, uh, being brash and bold. Uh, so Sean was not the easiest guy to get along with as far as creative and finishes and things. It wasn't a matter of hardly anything other than creative. And Sean was very protective of his, of his position and of his, of his, his lot in life, his gimmick. So, uh, and, and Sean was, <clears throat> pardon me, Cornette was just, uh, couldn't understand why Vince let the inmates run the asylum as much as Sean was seemingly able to do. Let's also mention that, uh, they even put Cornette on pay-per-view. He has a match against Jose Lothario at in your house mind games. This can't be something corny wanted to do. Is this something that one of the Vince's pitched and it was eventually just sort of forced on him and well, shit, I guess I gotta be a loyal soldier and go do it. It may have been a favor to Sean because Sean, Jose was Sean's guy, you know, teaching him how to work, broke him in all that good stuff. Cause I remember when we hired Sean Michaels in the mid South, uh, it was on the recommendation of, of Jose who was Bill Watts considered a friend and had great respect for. So with Jose, uh, training Sean and saying, I got this kid, Bill, you got to see, I think he's really going to be a great baby face, especially, uh, baby, you know, you look like a baby face, you know, you know, he, he just, he, he was, Sean was natural. And the fact that then when Vince got Sean there, he put Sean with Ricky and Robert. And then he set up that learning tree and learned a hell of a lot about being a baby face. So, uh, it may have been a favor to, to Jose to get a shot of a, to actually get in the ring on a uh, WWF pay-per-view and therefore create more cash for him. I don't remember anybody lobbying for that match, quite frankly. And it may have been a half ass. You know, Vince sometimes will do these ribs, believe it or not, uh, where he put people in matches or scenarios in the ring that they may not want to be in. Really? Yeah, I heard that. And uh, so I think that's part of that deal too, just to see the just screwing with corny, maybe a little bit, but I don't know that anybody on the in, inner circle there that was just jonesing like a son of a bitch to have Cornette in the ring working with a, you know, 50 plus year old Jose Lothario at one time was one of the great workers in the country. Just why, why are we doing this? Who did it help? And, and, and could we not put this, some talent in the ring and use that TV time for somebody else that could actually use it? And I think that was part of Cornette's biggest concern there is that, like I said before about my own situations, somebody else could use the TV time more than me. And I think Cornette felt the same way. Let's talk a little bit about, um, what's next for corny. 
I think he's going to step up and do voiceovers for superstars one day when Kurt Hennig no shows and he's thought to be done with the company. So the, the, all the commentary has to be redone. Well, fast forward to 1997, he's added to the commentary team and he's not only going to work with you, but most of the other announcers, the product is definitely evolving in 97 and he's becoming uh, more edgy along with the actual on-screen product. What do you remember about 97 and his transition to mostly backstage creative and at the desk and maybe moving away from the managing stuff? Well, I thought that we weren't utilizing our assets fully, how you cannot find a spot for a manager of Cornette's skill set in a, in a area area that is uh, rapidly deteriorating from that category. I thought that was a mistake. Uh, but him being on the air as a broadcaster, at least got him on television. And it's not just a matter of getting him on television, get him on TV to contribute and help get talent over. Uh, I thought was a good thing. So, uh, but it seemed like a somewhat of a waste of his, his abilities that he wasn't managing somebody that we wanted to really tie a, a, uh, you know, a rocket ship to and, and to get over. I thought he could have done that with a variety of talents, but certainly, uh, that wasn't the case. And again, you know, he's, he's got some, he's got some enemies on the inside that just, you know, didn't like his outspokenness and his demeanor attitude, whatever you want to say, uh, that didn't do him any favors, but it seemed like a waste of talent to me that he wasn't managing somebody. Of course, he's going to be uh, with the headhunters in a one-off and we're going to get tons of questions about that. Do you remember why the headhunters were brought in? I think they attacked the headbangers and, uh, Davy boy and Owen Hart. I, it looks like Corny's with them. And then we never hear from him again. What happened so quickly with the headhunters for them to be in and out? I don't have any idea. I don't remember that whatsoever. Uh, it's such an in out blink of the eye. You miss it type deal. Uh, because there's no doubt that Cornette could have been a great manager for the headhunters. He could be a great manager for anybody. Well, we're going to put that to the test later in 97, but first I do want to ask about these work shoot promos. Uh, apparently I guess he was doing this in production and writing team meetings where he's just going off about the business. And somebody says, you know what, let's film that and put it on TV. And he has a, a few famous ones, you know, one where he talks about the NWO and makes some not so nice remarks about Hulk Hogan and Sean Waltman and Eric Bischoff. He does another about the Halloween Havoc 97 main event with Piper and Hogan in a cage match. They call it age in the cage. This is pretty good stuff, especially if you're trying to get a, a more edgy program. Cornette just doing his thing is a natural for TV. And as a fan of home, I loved it. what did you think of these work shoot promos that he was doing on raw in this era? Mixed, mixed emotions, uh, whether entertaining. Yeah, sure. They were no doubt. Uh, Vince McMahon loved him. He wanted to be edgier. Right. He wanted, he wanted the attitude era to be full of attitude. And, and that certainly helped perpetuate that uh, philosophy. But I, I just thought it's the same thing. I, I'm consistent with my thinking again, I may be backward, but you know, are, is there a better way to utilize the TV time that's limited and it's like perishable fruit. Once it goes bad, once it goes past, you can't go back and retrace it. You can't go back and recapture it. So I, I thought it was a, was it entertaining? Oh, God, yeah, it was entertaining. But I didn't know it entertained the masses as much as it entertained uh, a, a more of a minority. Was it mass appeal? I don't know that answer. Did I like it? Did I get a kick out of it? Yes. But where are we going with it? What's it going to do? How are we going to mo monetize this TV time that we've invested in these promos? I'm certainly not knocking the entertainment side of it, but my deal was what is the payoff? Right. And I'm a big believer Conrad at the bottom line. What's the payoff? You said, Hey, we want to do another podcast. Well, I don't know. Well, here's what we'll pay you. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. So about that, that was a deal. I, I just entertaining. Yes. Provocative. Absolutely. But where is it going? What is, where is it going to take us? And maybe it didn't need to take us anywhere. Maybe this needed to help perpetuate the new image that we were, we were headed towards in the, uh, in the attitude era, which by the way, was the, 
most lucrative time in, in WWF history. Uh, so maybe that was right all along. I don't know. But it, it was the interesting things that we kind of broke the cafe. We broke down the wall and we started mentioning the other promotions. Now you wouldn't hear them do that today at all. So, uh, it's just, uh, it's, 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 subje it's so, so subjective, Conrad, really it is. So again, executed like a champion, creative as hell. He ad lived that shit. He had a German idea and he goes on camera and he kills it. I agree and admit all of that. They're very, very entertaining. But my point was, where does it take us? How do we get money out of this deal? And if it's simply the, the fact that we're underscoring our new attitude and our new, uh, philosophy, then so be it. Maybe that's the reason. Other than that, uh, I wonder how, where it's going to go. It didn't last that long. It seemed like the last few weeks, but they certainly were talked about and entertaining. And today's, in today's social media landscape, those son bitches would be gold. Well, something else that, uh, had everybody talking was the Montreal screw job. I kind of get the vibe from watching that story on vice with his participation, but he takes credit for the Montreal screw job. Like it was his idea. You ever hear that from him? Uh, yeah. The fact that, well, the, the theory was it wasn't a, an anti Bret Hart thing. It was a simple, the fact that you got to control your title, right? And the title, your, your championship is the most important thing and most important entity, even though it's an inanimate object, it's the most important entity that you, that you possess within your company is your championships and making the championships have value and meaning. And that was the, his, his argument was that, that the championship was very valuable. It was the, the, the crown jewel of the promotion and, and we're going to do what? And so he, he went old school thinking you, you can't, we can't do this. So whether he, I've heard him talk about it. I don't know if it's totally his idea or not, to be honest with you, because I was not involved in that whatsoever. I'm, I'm glad to say after all these years, I didn't know what was happening until I saw it before my very eyes. True statement. Absolutely true. But, uh, it was one of those few times that a secret was actually kept and, uh, cafe to a lot of people, I guess over the years, more people will tell you they knew about it than others. I just, I've been consistent with my story all along. Just telling the truth. I don't, I didn't know. I still didn't, I still don't know. And when I saw it happen, uh, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, so if, if Corny had a instrumental part in coming up with an idea to be able for us to possess uh, the title once that survivor series was over in November of 97, then uh, I, I got no, I got no reason to, to dis to disallow that or, or to not believe it. Uh, unfortunately, the next big thing that we see Jim involved with is the NWA invasion and he brings back the NWA North American championship. He starts managing Jeff Jarrett. Eventually they put together the new midnight express with Bart Gunn and Bob Holly. This feels like something that you've told the story before that you said Vince acquiesced to you wanting to hire Mick Foley. And he said, I'm going to let you do it just so you can know what it feels like to have a talent break your heart. And this feels like something that, and again, I wasn't there. Nobody's told me this, but it feels like maybe in these creative meetings and you know, there's no bad ideas in a, in a brainstorming session type deal that maybe he keeps going back to the old school way of doing things. And maybe Vince says, okay, let's give him a shot at that. Knowing it's not going to work. Is that the sort of read you got on it? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I never, I never thought that trying to put another team together, like the midnight express was a good idea with no matter who the participants were, this didn't, I didn't, didn't make sense to me. Uh, but that, that, Hey, look, that whole end of that invasion thing, suck pond water. It, we, it was so under, it, so underachieved. Could have been so much bigger, but it wasn't. We talked about that before, uh, and Vince lost his patience on it. He didn't give the, the newcomers uh, that we acquired from WCW the chance to uh, get over. Uh, at least that's how I look back at it. Maybe then I might have been on the same page with him that you know this is this sucks. This ain't gonna work. And so I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think Vince would do anything that he knew was going to 
with any put any time in anything Conrad that was he thought was going to suck or be the shits embarrass the company but if he if it had a remote chance of working and the pitch was strong enough you know he he would try things like that so but I don't think anybody on the inside thought that you know uh, that anybody would confuse two excellent talents like Bart and uh, and Bob Holly with Dennis and Bobby or or or, or Bobby and Stan just wasn't going to happen. They're, it's apples and oranges. The only things that they like is they're two things. They're they're all they're they're Caucasian wrestlers, and they got the and they got the same team name. That's kind of where it ended. In this era, is he not only working creative but also supporting you in talent relations? No, uh, he wasn't in talent relations. Here, here's the reason I ask because we've seen a famous clip on Beyond the Mat. And I think that happened on September 15th, 1998 at a TV taping in Sacramento, California. Yeah. We see Mike modest and Tony Jones working a dark match. And we see you and Cornette backstage watching on a monitor and talking to the guys before and after the match. And that just made me wonder, Hey, was corny involved in that? Or was that just for the cameras? Well, Cornette was a great talent evaluator. And he was also good about talking to a talent and telling him, Hey, be sure you do more of that. You do this really well. Do some more of that. Uh, you don't throw good punches, for example. So don't don't overload your punching uh, uh, regimen in this match. Things like that. He was really good at booking a match, putting a finish together, those things. But as far as talent relations, and because when I think of talent relations, I think of hiring, firing, negotiating, that type of stuff. And he wasn't involved in that. But once the talents are on site, on site like uh, those two kids, uh, then then their story went. He, he was a very he was there, and he's he's a good he's a good ally, a good resource. Uh, but you know, a lot of those, a lot of times too, in the, in the filming of uh, Beyond the Mat, the camera was kind of obscure. So sometimes stuff I know there are things I saw in there that I didn't even know the camera was focused on at that point in time. But so no, to answer your question directly, Cornette was not involved in, in the, the entire scope of talent relations, but he certainly uh, was involved on more than one occasion in helping talents uh, work on deficiencies or recognize what their skill sets were. One of his uh, last big moments on WWF TV is the WrestleMania 7 or 17 rather cameo in the gimmick battle royal, but that's two years after he decides I've had enough of the Northeast in 99. He's tired of Connecticut. He's not getting along with Russo and Dunn. So he buys into Ohio Valley wrestling. Uh, when did you know that he was looking for a way out? And how did this whole thing with Ohio Valley become a developmental territory? And you, you still keep a relationship. Well, I think it wasn't that long after he got there that he was, he, he was more than willing to leave. It's living in the Northeast, the weather, the traffic, the food for him at times. Sound like a minor thing, but for some people it isn't. But the weather and the traffic were something to deal with. Cost of living, another issue that was different. So uh, he, he never liked living in the Northeast. Uh, so I, th I think if an opportunity had, had presented itself uh, before Ohio Valley Wrestling, he'd have jumped at it. But when he, when he had enough, enough is enough. I can't stand it no more. As Popeye would say, uh, that he, he, he was, he, he had to figure out something else. He just, he couldn't do, he couldn't, he couldn't tolerate living there. And he didn't like the scenario, he didn't, the office politics, the bureaucracy, even though it was not as much as it is now, apparently there, uh, he just, he wasn't, he wasn't comfortable with it. So I wasn't surprised about it, but, but I did know this. I knew that we as a company had to continue to, to cultivate and train new faces, new potential stars. And I was going to hire as many viable prospects as myself and our team could facilitate. And I also knew that if we did that, it would perpetuate the business for years to come, which it has by the way. And the fact that in Ohio Valley wrestling, that Cornette would put a team together that may not always be politically correct, but the talent's going to come out of there knowing how to wrestle, how to tell a story, and how and respecting the business by and large. 
And even though a lot of guys have gone on to become big stars, big major multimillionaire Hall of Fame like guys will will never get Cornet the credit that's due, they would not have gotten the opportunity to get to WWE on the time schedule that they were that they were on that helped facilitate their stardom and their income if it hadn't been for the training they got in Ohio Valley Wrestling. Case closed. How um how does Vince come around to this idea of having a, a feeder system, a minor league system, a developmental system? Well, he trusted me, Conrad. He, he trusted me. He, 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 he it, this is not a revelationary thing that look, we got to get younger, right? You know, uh, we, we can't keep repackaging this guy. He gets a new set of tights or you got a new, this or a new music or whatever. Uh, so we, we, we have to evolve and develop new stars. As I said earlier in the show, people love new wrestling fans specifically love new. And, and, uh, the, the theory was, is that the guys like Al Snow, uh, Rip Rogers, who's a great coach and Al is too. Al's running Ohio Valley. Now he owns it. Uh, I knew they'd be taught right. Uh, and then, and the, and the talents would be taught responsibility and respect. In example, we told us before, who was the head of the ring crew at Ohio Valley wrestling Brock Lesnar. My God, how would you do that? Well, why would you do that? Because he liked driving a fucking truck. That's why folks, he liked hauling things, right? He liked, he liked being the supervisor and it taught him responsibility that there's more to this stuff than just showing up and, and, uh, doing an F five. And so that's why, and, and uh, everybody there had a job. We had a very, we had a very, our ring crow's badass. <laughs> so, uh, that was a deal. We, we got it. We got to keep. And then after that, we had one in, in, in Cincinnati, uh, uh, and, and Les Th- Thasher was there. Another guy I had great, I, I relied on and depended on and knew he, was, he would, he would teach the right things, right philosophy, right, right from wrong and all that stuff. So, uh, and then we had one in Memphis. The one in Memphis never worked out well, uh, but you know, and we had others, but the Ohio Valley wrestling was the, the benchmark for us. You know, we, when we sent guys there, look at the guys that came through Ohio OVW. Let's do it. Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Batista, Randy Orton, Shelton, Benjamin on and on and on. And it, it's, it's a home run. You and Jim Cornette working together, you know, you, you help him find the talent and send them down to Ohio Valley. He gets them ready boom, we've got, you know, create a superstar here, but it doesn't feel like that momentum continues. Once you step down from talent relations, John Laurinaitis takes the spot. It's never quite the same. Eventually Cornette has a meltdown. The relationship is severed with him and WWE from that point. What worked so well about the way you and Jim did it that just didn't work when you weren't there? Well, we have the same agenda. The same agenda was to produce new talents. Uh, you know, Laurinaitis was new on the job. He was trying to build his own reputation, build his own platform, create the, the department in his, his, his image and philosophy. Cornette and I had the same philosophy. I knew that I kept Cornette away from Vince and the corporate meetings, kept him away from Kevin Dunn, for example, among others, that we had a, a chance to keep Cornette, uh, on the, on the hook to hook to us because I want to take advantage of his teaching and his, he was very demanding. He had structure, believe it or not. So, uh, but we just, we're on the same page in that regard. And I let him coach his team. I never one, one time said, I want this guy to be a baby face or this guy to be a heel that I could ever recall. It wasn't my place to do that. I didn't need to do that. That's micromanaging. And there's no sense in it. It's just, it defies logic in that regard. Let the guys that are there every day with these talents every day, make those decisions. When you see the TV shows, which we saw every week and we saw things that were not going down the way that they should be in our view, we could correct it then. But unless you're there every day in practice and you're seeing these guys do what they do, how they drill, how they work, uh, then how do you make those decisions? You can't intelligently. So, and I don't think Jimmy and, uh, and John had never, ever had the relationship 
You know, Cornette, unfortunately for, for Laurinaitis, I think looked at Laurinaitis as one of the dynamic dudes as opposed to one of the head of talent relations. And that's not, that's not cool. So they're just different pages, different philosophies. And, uh, I, and, and that whole, that whole area didn't ever rebound until triple H created NXT. Hypothetically, let's just pretend for a minute. Hypothetical. If you don't step down from uh, head of talent relations and you're still in that role, if you were still doing it today. You think Cornette would still be running OVW or something like it? I mean, would he still, that just seemed to work so well. I can't imagine why it wouldn't continue. It would work if he was left alone. Right. But will, will corporate publicly traded company bureaucracy allow that to happen? Unlikely. So my answer to your question is probably no time. We, the times have changed so drastically. That I don't think Cornette would have, uh, would fit into that, that landscape. Now, whether that landscape is, is right or wrong, it's that's up for debate for sure, but it is what it is in this, this respect. And, uh, so I don't, I don't think it would have worked. I don't think it would work now. And I also think at a certain point, you know, the reason he, he, he had some blow, he had a blow up there and he, I think he had something with Santino Morella or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Corny's burned out, right? He was tired of quote unquote babysitting. And so I think that was the cause of that deal. He, I don't think he stopped loving the business or he certainly didn't get lazy all of a sudden. I just think it's just the world was changing so rapidly. His world was changing as far as the WWF was concerned, WWE, whatever. And, uh, that it, he just couldn't handle it. He didn't feel right about it. So, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons of his, some of his outbursts today on, on his podcast, you know, I, I don't know why he didn't, he's going to land bass somebody. I wish he'd land bass. He'd go would land bass another company other than, than, uh, AEW as much as he does. Cause I take some of that personally. I get like, like, you know, wait a minute. I know as much about wrestling as you do. I've been, we've been on a lot of the same journeys here. So don't bullshit me about this. Is, this should change. This should, well, you know, it's a different world, uh, in that regard. I'm not telling you I like it. I'm telling this what it is. I hate Con- Conrad. I don't have to fucking COVID-19 either. Okay. Right. No part of it. There's nothing good about it. Unless you're a pharmaceutical company, you're going to make a fortune on a vaccine that we allegedly are going to have now around election time. Wink, wink. How about that? That's so convenient. Bullshit. So it's the world's changing and a lot of us have just got to change with it or, or, or just, or, or get out, you know, you get along, you move along and corny was willing and saved his money. He has some other ways to make money. You know, Cornette collectibles does real well. He's written books. He's, he's an, he's an entrepreneur and a damn good one. But I don't think in today's world where you're talking to young talents that have been raised in different homes with different philosophies and different eras than we were. You can't manage them exactly the same. You just got to change because when you're not able to communicate with a talent, when you're not able to communicate with a family member, when you're not able to communicate with an employee, you're not, you're not doing the best you can for you and them. And sometimes that means that the senior members like me have got to, have got to compromise and you got to change and be willing to listen to another alternative. There's things I call on wrestling, uh, and, I, and this has been this way for years, that I don't like. Right. But that's not my call. My call is to show up, do my job, and do the best I can to get talent over. It's simple as that. Whether I believe or not that they deserve or they ever will get over, that's irrelevant. And I, I, I've been able to try to move on in that regard. Uh, and, and I'm enjoying the hell out of my, my experience right now. Best job I've had best boss I've ever had Tony Khan. But the bottom line of it is, is that Cornette, I don't think would ever be able to, uh, bend his principles, his philosophies in his own mind's eye to make that work. Let's, uh, mention a couple more things. Then we'll wrap things up here. We didn't talk about it, but we did allude to the fact that boy, once upon a time, Jim was known for some legendary blowups. Did you ever feel the wrath of one? No. I mean, we, we, we argued, uh, I remember one time we were, I, I, I taped a bunch of, uh, some vignettes for WrestleMania 12 and, uh, at, with Bret Hart 
on a cold ass day in Calgary and the, the team was there getting ready to do TV. So they were in their production meeting and I was late. And the reason I was late was because Brett was late. And anybody that knows Brett, God bless him. He, he's sometimes been known to have a little challenging, challenging times to tell, to tell time. So I get back to the meeting. It's real late and I sit down at the table with a normal crew, you know, Vince, Bruce, I think Kevin Dunn was there. I can't remember all the same normal, normal prospects, suspects. Cornette says, you know, well, it's kind of a wise ass remark about, well, it's about time, uh, you know, the star announcer or star, whatever, something along those lines shows up. And I said, you know, why don't you go fuck yourself? He didn't have, he didn't have any idea that I spent two hours alone with Stu. Right. Hey, yeah. Uh, let me uh, show you this little hole. Uh, if you start seeing spots, uh, that means I'm cutting the, uh, blood supply to your brain and you'll soon be losing consciousness. What? So I, I spent two hours of that. I spent, I'm in the, I'm in the dungeon Conrad alone with Stu. Not good. No, no. So he didn't know that story. I'd had a dreadful day. I love being around Stu and just sitting around shooting the shit. I don't love that, but I had a job to do that day. We had to get this stuff on tape. So get back to Stanford. They started editing. It was just, it was only for the main event of WrestleMania 12. And according to don't make me crawl, come across this table at your ass. I said, there ain't no anchor tied to your ass. So fucking have at it. Something along those lines. <laughs> and that would have been like, you know, two, tor- two turtles on their shell, trying to get off their shell and fight. It was, uh, I, it, it, I think it basically was a, a point of, uh, uh, comic relief for Vince and everybody else there. Cause they've been waiting and trying to have this work out and this, that, and the other. So, uh, but that was the closest anything like that ever happened. But, and, and, but in five minutes it was over. Right. But we've had booking. Well, I've been in booking committee meetings where he would uh, blow up at, at, at an idea or something like that, and we've debated, but never to the point of where we got kind of close to, you know, having a, a, a silly ass slap fight uh, and and doing you know stuff that would embarrass us and the company. But not not really. We we got along pretty damn good, and I like to think that we still get along today. We just don't communicate. Yeah. Let's talk about that. What's your relationship with him? Like now, I mean, you have his number, he has yours. You guys yeah. just busy life gets in the way. Y'all aren't cross or anything, right? No, no, hell no. Not at all. Hey, look, we don't agree philosophically on a lot of things, especially as it relates to the company I work for. And, uh, so that's a fact. And I, and I've never gone on social media, uh, and won't to com- com- complain about him, you know, uh, I know we have talents on the AW roster like FTR that that think he hung the thinks he hung the moon, and I can't deny what their what their thoughts are. Uh, you know they 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 do a lot of things that Bobby and Den, Bobby and Dennis and and Bobby and Stan did in in, in their own way. Uh, but I don't I'm not going I have never been on social media and not corny. Uh, and because but what I look at it is this, and I may be looking at it wrong. When he knocks AEW, he's kind of knocking me. I'm the, I'm the voice of the brand right now. Well, but some of that is, is him being an entertainer on his podcast, which by the way, you can find his two podcasts everywhere. You enjoy ours. Uh, it's the Jim Cornette experience and Corny's drive through, uh, experience is more long form on a singular topic. Drive through is more of a mailbag type Q and a, that's my favorite of the two, uh, Jim Cornette's collectibles, which is available at Jim Uh, Click on the collectibles link. You can buy t-shirts, books, certificates, DVDs, uh, autograph tape by tens, all kinds of crazy stuff. Even a burger towel. That's right. A burger towel. Uh, check it out over at jimcornette.com. I'm just fascinated by the way he has become just through the podcast and social media, this majorly polarizing figure without being on network TV. I mean, he's one of the yeah. quotas, the, the biggest quote unquote heels in wrestling right now. And he's just doing it from home. That's got to check all his boxes. Yeah, it does. And it shows you how bright he is, right? He's created a, a brand new persona to a brand new audience. Now the persona may not be brand new, 
but to this audience, it's new right. because he's been off t- national television for quite some time. He's reinvented himself to a, this today's audience. That's the mark of a great entrepreneur. And he's chosen the character of being a villain journalist, a, a, an opinion, a person with strong opinions. And, and, uh, so if you look at it in that regard, take a side that you don't agree with it. If you're a fan, well, I don't agree with what he says. Okay, fine. That's irrelevant. It really doesn't matter if you agree or not. You're talking about it. You're listening to his shows. You're reading what his, his uh, sound bites are on Twitter or wherever. And why, so he's reinvented himself in a very strategic way using the platform that he has at his disposal. You know, hey, look, if you had told me 10 years ago, you know, Jim Cornette's going to be big on Twitter. I said, you're full of shit. <laughs> That ain't going to happen, man. No. Are you kidding me? No. And, and I look at it now. Uh, I, I, when I see his, a post from him, I got to read it. Right. And, you know, uh, and of course right now he's, 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 he's balls deep in, uh, in, uh, anti-Trump stuff. And you know, that's just, but a lot of Americans are, and, and a lot of them aren't, I get that too, but he's reinvented himself in a very strategic way using the best vehicles that he has at his disposal to create income and cash flow. And he's and doing I, it well. So, so, sound like, yeah, sound like he's doing a damn good job of it. How do you think, uh, Cornette will be remembered? You know, he's, he's been at TNA. He's been at ring of honor. He's owned OVW. He's been with the NWA WCW, the WWF. Literally there's not much left that he hasn't done, but when it's all said and done, what will his legacy in wrestling be? Do you think? It'll be known as, uh, once you get past today's Jim Cornette and his, his philosophies and so forth, I think, uh, he'll be known as one of the top two or three managers of all time. Uh, he will always get my number one. Uh, and, but to say who's number two, I could make a very definitive argument that Jim Cornette's a number two manager of all time behind Heenan. Others, everybody's gonna have a subjective thing. Oh, well. You know, no excuse. I'll give you my opinion, folks. That's all. I think he's going to be known as one of the greatest uh, managers ever in wrestling. I think if you look at it objectively, he'll be known as one of the most bright and brilliant minds ever in wrestling. And then I just hope that his his uh, character that he's created now doesn't adversely affect that uh, perception. He's a Hall of Fame guy. Yep. Uh, without a doubt, uh, he could do so many things. Well, we've talked about all of the things he does. He's done well from booking to managing to announcing, uh, running a territory, all these things that, uh, should not be discounted and just, just take out. It's like, it's like judging the Olympics. You take out the high score and the low score, you get the average. If that's, if you do that with Cornette's career, take out the high and take out the low. He's still, uh, a hall of fame guy that will always be remembered, at least in my eyes as one of the most brilliant minds of anybody I've ever worked with in pro wrestling in a story. He's not in the WWE hall of fame yet, but you assume it's coming. He's been honored by the cauliflower alley reunion club. He's uh, obviously in the Southern wrestling hall of fame from 2015, the NWA hall of fame back in 05, the new England pro wrestling hall of fame from 2015. He won wrestler of the year in pro wrestling illustrated, sorry, manager of the year in pro wrestling illustrated in 85, 93 and 95, the pro wrestling hall of fame in 2012 and the observer absolutely loves him. He went in their hall of fame in 1996. He wrote their best book in 2009. He won manager of the year in the observer in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89 and 90. And then again, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96 best on interviews in 85, 86, 87, and 88. And again, in 93 best non wrestler in 2006 and best booker in 1993. And then of course, in 2001 and 2003 with OVW, it's pretty prestigious what he's been able to accomplish. You look through, you know, what his peers say about him and man, it's just hard to get anybody who worked with him to uh, not put him over. So we're doing that for his birthday about a week early, a week from today. The 17th is his birthday. 
And uh, I have it on good authority. What he wants most of all from you is for you to buy something from Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com <laughs> forward slash store. And, you know, I, I founded my research and maybe I, I remembered this when it first happened or it dawned on me when it first happened. But our topic next week is Bobby Heenan. And how weird of a coincidence is this? When we talk about all time great managers, we talk about, you know, Bobby Heenan and Jim Cornette. Those are usually the answers, maybe 1A and 1B. Yep. And unfortunately we lost Bobby on September 17th and that's the day Jim was born. How ironic yeah. is that? It is amazingly ironic. When you think about it like that, uh, what a small world in that regard. They both had a lot of things in common and I can't wait to talk about Bobby next week. It's going to be great. Uh, I'm going to have to break down and send Cornette some sauce and, uh, <laughs> and cause he, he likes free stuff. Of course. Who doesn't? And by the way, it's not free, but it, it feels like it. Cause it's such a great value. When you go to jrsbbq.com, you can pick up some sauce. Of course, uh, the seasoning is back in stock now. And I hear it is number one with a bullet. I'm still on the main event mustard. It works on everything. You've told me that the Chipotle ketchup makes a great steak sauce. I've yet to try that. Suffice to say, no matter what you're looking for, it's at jrsbbq.com, including the great new book under the black hat but you can get personalized and shipped to lower 48 all for one low price. Isn't that right, Jim? Absolutely. Free shipping in the, uh, continental USA for the book. And I'll personalize it. You get this little place when you order it, you just kind of, you tell me kind of what you want me to say. And, uh, it's, it's a great way to, to uh, personalize them. It's a great way for, for gifts for that wrestling fan. Uh, it's just really cool. And like I said last week or whenever I was hawking this stuff, you know, don't uh, wait too long for the holidays. I know it's early. We're not there yet. You know, let me up, Jr. I don't, it's not the Chris, not the holidays yet. But when you when it's time to shop for the holidays, just give us the uh, consideration that we might make some really good ideas for the fans and your family, uh, and we'd be happy to be a part of that to celebration and facilitate as best we can. So it's been good. The business has been really good and. And I'm very blessed with that and thankful, quite frankly, that all the fans have, have continued to support things I do. And I can't tell you how much it means to me. Well, and we appreciate you guys subscribing here. And by the way, I want to remind you, you could have gotten this show early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up next week. It's going to be Bobby, the brain Heenan. And the week after that it's unforgiven 2000. And of course we've got some great bonus stuff headed your way, including some video uh, the acclaimed series. I don't even know that you saw this Jim, but people are loving on the road again, which is a video series, sort of ride along style. We set up a couple of cameras and just record you and Tony Schiavone making your road trips. And then we edit it together. People have started to bootleg that and sell it on eBay. That's how much people love it. Really? It's been, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, we shut that shit down. We got a good attorney on our squad. It's exclusive to adfreeshows.com. You don't want to miss it. You get all these shows early and ad free with tons more bonus content coming your way. And we've got big plans headed down the pike. You don't want to miss it. Join us over at adfreeshows.com. Until next week, he is at JR's BBQ. I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Have you in a miss you, greasy devil? Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.